This is Camp Dread, a Blue Wolf Brief, the first in the Legion Files series, written by Brad Magnarella, narrated by James Patrick Cronin. Chapter One Man, I have been looking forward to this, Rusty said as he wheeled our cargo van from the pickup window. I can't believe you've never had a Big Top Burger. Maybe because I've never wanted to wait that long in a drive through line, I growled. Oh, it's so worth it, boss. In fact, I want to pull over so I can watch you take your first bite. You're going to think heaven slapped you right in the mouth. I snorted at his Kentuckyism, but shook my head. We have a case to get to. His look of anticipation sagged along with his wiry frame, though I couldn't deny that the greasy smells from our bags were making my mouth water. I was waving him toward the road when I stopped suddenly. Pull over, I said. Rusty straightened excitedly. Oh, thanks, boss. I know it's kind of weird me watching, but... Not for the burgers, I cut in, the moisture abandoning my mouth to a steely bite. For that. He followed my finger to where a fight had broken out on the far side of the dumpsters, mostly out of sight of the lot. Oh, crap, Rusty said. Yeah, yeah. Normally, I'd have let this sort of thing go. We were part of an elite unit, not a citizen patrol group. But a guy was out cold on the ground, and the three thugs who'd put him there were still stomping him. That wasn't the worst part. What must have been the victim's girlfriend was frantically trying to protect him. I caught one of the thugs, saying, This hoe must want to get knocked out, too. Call the police, I told Rusty. Tell them they're going to need ambulances for four. He nodded and slowed enough for me to get out. It was the laughter now that raised my hackles. The thugs were celebrating the beating they were putting on the guy while mocking his girlfriend. She was straddling the victim, legs bracing his torso, arms wrapping his head as she sobbed and pleaded for them to stop. If that's what she wants, another thug laughed, we'll serve up a two-four of K.O.'s. As he stepped in, his booted foot angling for her head, I grabbed the back of his shirt and yanked him into the side of a tricked-out truck. The banging impact left a round dent. He collapsed, head lolling in his lap. A second thug wheeled toward me. He had a moment to take in my seven-foot, four-hundred-pound frame before my right fist rocketed in. The collision of knuckles on jaw was less a crack than a shattering. He landed against another vehicle and stared back at me, eyes vacant, mouth dangling by the sinew. Then he sat hard, with blood, saliva, and tooth fragments spilling down the front of his shirt. The final thug jerked a pistol from the back of his pants and aimed it at my chest. Yeah, he grinned crazily, eyes engorged with adrenaline. Who's in charge now, mofo? He glanced over at the guy whose mouth I'd just retired from active duty as he toppled slowly onto his side. That was all the opening I needed. My arm shot forward, my hand swallowing his grip on his weapon. It's still me, I replied with a growl. I squeezed, compressing metacarpals and phalanges until they began popping like twigs. The thug screamed and beat my shoulder futilely with his other hand. I twisted his arm, forcing him to his knees. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, he begged, tears rolling down his tattooed cheeks. I went to one knee so we were out of view of the restaurant and pried off my helmet. His pain seemed to suspend for a moment as his eyes widened in disbelief and horror. Mostly horror. I brought my blue, fang-lined muzzle forward until it was nearly touching his nose and stared him down. I've got your scent now, I growled. If I have to hunt you down, I'll be your worst fucking nightmare. Do you understand? I twisted his arm another degree. Yes, 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 he panted tearfully. I'll be good, I'll be good, I promise. I yanked the bent gun from his ruined grip and smashed my forehead into his, sending him to the ground. I barely felt anything. Neither did he now. I replaced my helmet and straightened from his limp body. It had happened quickly, about ten seconds from start to finish. The young woman was still covering her boyfriend. It's over, ma'am, I said in my East Texas drawl. You're safe now. She looked up with damp eyes, then around at the three downed thugs. She may have been small, but she wore a look of resolve. I could see her mind making the connection between their condition and my arrival. Mind if I take a look at him? I asked. She studied my helmet, 
the large breathing apparatus accommodating my muzzle and modulating my growly voice. Are you a doctor? she asked in confusion. Former Special Forces, I have medical training. Help is on the way, but he might need to be stabilized. I looked over at our van where Rusty was on his phone with the dispatcher. He gave me a thumbs up. The woman climbed off her boyfriend. I spent the next several minutes palpating his torso, neck, and extremities, and then inspecting the cuts and contusions. He was breathing, thankfully, and his pulse felt strong. When I patted his cheek, his eyelids fluttered open. Rico? The woman said, hopefully. Belle? He breathed, drawing a smile from her before his eyes closed again. He's concussed, I explained, but nothing feels broken, and I don't see any obvious signs of internal damage. He'll still need to be checked out. Those guys claimed Rico cut them off in traffic, she said, but he didn't. Yeah, the cowards were just looking for a fight. You saved him from getting hurt a lot worse than he did. Rico owes you a night out. When sirens sounded in the distance, I backed toward our van. We didn't need to deal with local law enforcement. We were already behind schedule. I eyed the thugs a final time. They wouldn't be getting up any time soon. Just stay with him, ma'am, I said. The police and ambulances will be here in a couple minutes. Wait, what's your name? Wolf. It was my last name, but it also covered what I'd become. She folded her hands in front of her. God bless you, Mr. Wolf. Chapter Two This stays between us. I reminded Rusty as our van shot across the county line. You got it, boss, but dang, you should have seen yourself. He mimed the yanking, punching, and headbutting, then let out an appreciative laugh. That was badass. Yeah, well, the Centurion suits won't think so, and we just got out of their doghouse. Hey, these freckled lips are sealed. As the adrenaline from the encounter waned, I began downing my burgers, one after another. In the windshield's polarized glass, I caught the faint impression of my hulking figure, a taloned hand pinching a half-eaten burger, dabs of condiments clotting the hair around my muzzle. When I noticed Rusty watching, I pushed down the rest of it and chased it with 64 ounces of iced tea. Amazing, right? He asked. Pretty darned good, I agreed, wiping my mouth. But how about keeping your eyes on the asphalt? We were entering mountain country in southern Oregon, and the road had begun to wind. Rusty gripped the wheel at ten and two, but not for very long. He adjusted his foam trucker hat, took two rapid swigs of Red Bull, scratched an ear, then smoothed his mutton chop sideburns. Our equipment manager had ADD, but this was something else. He glanced over at me, then back at the road. What's up? I asked, speaking as his captain now. So, this job we're headed to, I'm not sure I'm getting my head all the way around it. Some campers freaked out over some spooky stories and now their counselor is missing? What does one have to do with the other? That's what Sarah's looking into, I said, referring to our chief investigator and medic. The data she's collected so far suggests there could be a supernatural connection. She'll brief us when we arrive. This just doesn't feel like a Legion job he said. I mean, usually there's a lead team, we have our mission meeting at the compound, some drilling maybe, then you give me the equipment list and I make sure we're all locked and loaded. But this, it feels like a couple dudes on a road trip being asked to help out a friend. Super ad hoc. Yeah, and what have I been drilling into you guys? The need for adaptability. That's why we keep an essentials kit in here. I jerked my head toward the van's cargo hold, This'll be good practice. Maybe, he allowed. But what about the rest of the team? Following our just-completed mission, there'd been a screw-up with air transport, no room for the cargo van. Rather than wait for it to get sorted, I volunteered Rusty and myself to drive it back to our compound outside Vegas. I needed a little freedom, and I wanted the rest of the team to get their R&R &R while Sarah looked into a case deemed low probability. we just crossed into northern Nevada when she called and requested our presence, the case's status having climbed to medium. Me and my MP-88 aren't enough for you, I said to Rusty, half-joking. Nah, it's not that, boss. Then why don't you tell me what's really bugging you? He adjusted his grip on the steering wheel. I don't like spooky camp stories. A snort escaped my snout. 
We've seen things in our time with Legion that go way beyond spooky. Yeah, but the spooky stuff is what keeps you up at night. Gives you bad dreams. If we need support, we'll bring in the others. His eyes brightened. Even tea cakes? Takara, I corrected him, referring to our dragon shifter teammate. And I'd be careful about saying that to her face. She'll give you a lot more than bad dreams. But yeah, we'd call up all three. All right, boss. I feel better now. He drummed his hands on the steering wheel for several beats before pausing and squinting toward me. But no one's going to tell that story about the hook man, are they? An hour later, Rusty turned off onto a dirt road and drove past a painted wooden sign hanging between two poles. Camp Courage. We circled an empty activities field and a cluster of log cabin buildings. Where are the kids? Rusty asked, peering around. The camp relocated them to a nearby school until we give the all clear. It'll just be us, the camp directors, and their head of maintenance. Makes the place kind of creepy, being empty like this. I knew what he meant. It wasn't just the 80s slasher film look, either. The air felt charged, as if someone or something was watching from back in the trees. Though I couldn't see anything, it was putting my wolf nature on edge. I spotted Sarah down a desolate road waiting for us in front of the cabin that would operate as our command center. She was wearing her tactical belt and vest with civvies underneath, khaki slacks and a white shirt, the sleeves rolled up, and had cinched her brunette hair into an all-business ponytail. She blinked mechanically behind her glasses as we parked, no smile or wave. Rusty jumped down from the driver's seat and arched his back, sending a series of pops up his narrow spine. Ooh, baby, that's nice. Hey, Sarah, I called as I got out. Jason? She issued a single nod. I'll brief you after you unload. And that was Sarah McKinnon in a nutshell. Not much personality, but she possessed genius-level smarts and was damned good at what she did. Though I reported to her, we were equals in the Legion program. She handled the info, I trained and led the team in the field, and we collaborated on mission planning. Rusty reached back into the van. It's your lucky day, Sarah. He reappeared with a half-crushed to-go bag and dangled it like a tantalizing treat. Got you a big top meal! She regarded the bag flatly as several cold fries spilled out. I'm not hungry. The cabin was spacious and basic. The camp had put some effort into cleaning and patching it before Sarah's arrival, but there were still holes in the walls and floor planks, and the space reeked of mouse droppings. When we finished setting up, I locked the cabin door, removed my helmet and peeled off my suit to the waist. A cracked mirror on the far wall framed what I'd become. A massive wolf man with peaked ears, a powerful muzzle and shaggy hair that gleamed under the fluorescent bulbs. Even four months after my transformation in Central Asia, I was still getting used to the sight of myself as the blue wolf. Can we start? Sarah asked. Go ahead, Rusty said as he untangled a pair of computer cables. I'm almost done. I joined her at a table where she'd arranged the mission info, including a large map of the camp and surrounding wilderness. There are six main cabins in the camp, she began. Each sleeps twelve, plus a counselor. The unusual activity was concentrated around cabin B, a girl's cabin. She tapped a building set slightly apart from the others. Robin Bloom was their counselor. The missing girl, I said. Woman, legally, she's nineteen. Little corrections like that used to bug me, but it was just Sarah's style. She dealt in exacts. Bloom was a popular counselor, she continued, partly for the stories she told after lights out. They were of the frightening variety often shared around campfires to excite a fight-or-flight response, urban legends and their equivalents. Rusty, who'd been sauntering up, hesitated with a worried look. You're not gonna tell the stories now, are you? Misunderstanding him, Sarah said, I'll keep them brief. On Sunday night, Bloom told the story known as the Hook Man. Oh, come on, he complained. And elements of the story appeared to manifest outside the cabin. Are you freaking serious? Rusty cried. Chapter 3 The urban legend of the Hook Man varied depending on who told it. I'd heard at least three versions growing up. In the one Sarah told, a couple is parked at an overlook at night when an emergency radio broadcast announces that a killer with a hook for a hand has just escaped a nearby institution. When they hear something outside the car, the boyfriend goes to investigate and is gone a long time. 
A rain cloud passes at one point. As it's tapering off, the police arrive. They coax the woman out, telling her not to look back. But as she's getting into their squad car, she peeks and sees her boyfriend suspended in a tree above his car, his body torn and his throat slashed. That rain she heard, boss, Rusty said in a cringing voice. It was his blood. The same night that Bloom told the hookman story, Sarah continued. Several girls in the cabin heard noises, something sharp and metallic scraping the cabin walls, liquid dripping on the rooftop at intervals. But when they went outside in the morning, there was no evidence to suggest anyone had been there. Maybe someone pulling a prank? Rusty asked, hopefully. No evidence, Sarah repeated, deepening the worry lines across Rusty's brow. On Monday night, her story was about the bandaged horror. This one has to do with a man who mutilated animals as a disturbed boy. Years later, he's mangled in a sawmill accident, becoming mutilated himself. After his death, he's seen roaming the woods and festering bandages alongside the animals he tortured, all of them searching for human prey. Rusty didn't appear as bothered by this one. Sounds a little like Olaf, he remarked, except for the mutilating animals part. He was referring to our Polish teammate who'd been reassembled following a landmine accident and now had the look and bearing of a zombie. Solid soldier, though. That night, several girls reported moans outside the cabin and the scratching of animal claws. Sarah continued. Some even smelled rotting flesh. Tuesday night, it was the story of the wailing woman. Oh yeah, I've heard that one, Rusty said, turning to me. In olden times, this woman axed her four children so she could be with this married dude she was seeing on the sly. But when he finds her covered in blood, he bolts. Heartbroken, the woman offs herself, but not before blaming the dude for what she did to her kids. That was the only way she could live with it, or die with it, I guess. So now her ghost wanders around, screaming for her children and punishing cheating men. He shook his head grimly before looking up suddenly. But that hook man... He'll go after anyone with a pulse. Rusty's account is mostly accurate, Sarah said. The girls reported hearing screams that night and seeing a glowing apparition out the cabin windows. They described her as having long, unkempt hair and wearing a bloody white gown. Yep, that's her, Rusty said with the confidence of an expert. Bloom remained in a deep sleep, Sarah finished. The girls couldn't awaken her. Yeah, cause she told the story, Rusty said indignantly. They're always the first ones to fall asleep. So what's got you thinking Prod 1? I asked Sarah. Prod 1 was short for Prodigium 1, a fancy way we had of saying predatory supernatural. When I investigated Cabin B, I picked up abnormal electromagnetic readings in the range of spectral activity. Was there a source? She shook her head. Diffuse. Assuming the kids actually saw something, what does the database say? I asked. She consulted the file she'd started. Spectral beings top the list. Ghosts, poltergeists, phantasmal imprints. But they're not known for disappearing people. When I queried for enchantments and illusions, the strongest returns were for fey beings and magic users. Vampires came in a distant third. Some can induce hallucinations. All three are in the low probability range, however. So nothing concrete yet, I mused. Let's hear about the counselor. Robin Bloom disappeared Wednesday, the day after she told the Wailing Woman's story. She was last seen leaving the dining hall a little before 1 p.m. When she failed to turn up for a 4 p.m. meeting and no one could locate her, the camp organized a search. Most of her belongings were still in the cabin, but her backpack was missing. She didn't have a phone on her. This is an electronics-free camp, and no car for her to have left in. No boyfriend, stalkers, or jealous exes to anyone's knowledge. Was a missing person report filed? She nodded. By Steve Hanseroff, the camp director? No official response yet? That didn't surprise me. Law enforcement resources were strained across the country. Steve co-directs the camp with his wife Alice, she continued. The accounts about the nighttime stories and phenomena came out when Steve and Alice were questioning the girls in Bloom's cabin. The two disregarded the accounts, but passed the info to the owner, Myoga Ventures. Myoga owns a number of camps on the West Coast, part of its asset portfolio, the CEO was the one who requested Legion take a look. I wondered if this CEO had a connection to Berglund, another investor client we'd helped recently, but it wasn't important. A girl was missing. What do we know about Bloom as a person? I asked. Sarah consulted the file again. She's been a counselor here the past three summers, attends college in Medford, 
Social work major with a minor in creative writing. No records of disciplinary action. No arrest records either. Her father is deceased and her mother lives in Florida. She's been notified, of course. Doesn't sound like the kind of gal who'd run off, Rusty remarked. Could she have gotten lost? I asked, nodding at the map. There's a lot of wilderness around here. She often took walks on the nature trails, but the camp boundary is fenced, minimizing that likelihood, Sarah replied. I studied the boundary. Should we consider that she might be the prod one? Nothing in her background suggests supernatural abilities, Sarah replied. Professor Croft said his abilities didn't manifest until he was a teenager, I pointed out, referring to my New York-based wizard friend. Hers might have come on recently, maybe without her even realizing it. Perhaps, but the skillful deployment of magic takes time, and what's been reported is beyond the ability of a novice practitioner. I nodded. I should head out then, see what I can pick up. Steve and Alice are staying in the living quarters of the administration building, Sarah said, indicating the central part of the map where the main buildings were clustered. I interviewed them earlier. They reported no suspicious activity in the camp prior to Bloom's disappearance. They left to run supplies to the school and won't be back until later this evening. Luke Dunphy is the head of maintenance. I haven't spoken to him yet. His place is out here. She pointed to a small cabin beside a work shed. He plans to use the camper's absence to complete some repairs around the grounds. I would have preferred having the camp to ourselves, but the order had likely come down from this Myoga Ventures. The camp was an asset, after all. That personal item you mentioned? I prompted Sarah. She retrieved a plastic bag and pulled out a green t-shirt belonging to Bloom. I took it and brought it to my nose, inhaling a bouquet of lotion, bug spray, sweat, and skin cells. I also smelled her youth, which set off a sequence of protective responses. With her scent locked in my old factory vault, I checked my watch. We have less than an hour of daylight, I turned to Rusty. Security here, surveillance around cabin B. Then get Drone 1 airborne and start scanning the area for any sign of bloom. She's already been out one night. Aye, aye, boss. I was running searches on the region's history when you arrived, Sarah said. There are some hits I want to probe more deeply. Sounds good. I'll be in radio contact. As Sarah got to work on her laptop, I redonned my suit. I strapped on a tactical belt with a holstered sidearm, spare mags, and a pair of metal stakes. We had bigger weapons in our armory, but I wanted to go light for now, cover as much ground as possible. My senses were already sharpening with the urgency of the mission. Supernatural case or not, a young woman was missing, going on thirty hours. Chapter 4 I quickly hid on a strong scent of bloom outside the mess hall and followed it to a trailhead on the north end of the campground. The path entered thick woods before re-emerging near the shore of Courage Lake. Slanting afternoon light glimmered from the water, and several canoes bobbed beside a dock that extended from the beach near an old boathouse. I followed the path and Bloom's scent around the lake. On the far side, both ran alongside a tall chain-link fence. So far, it looks like the kid went on one of her walks. But her scent soon broke from the trail and turned along a faint path toward the fence. A long cut had been made along a post, creating a hard-to-see opening. I peeled the section of fencing back, breaking several additional links to accommodate my bulk until I was through. Within several paces, I found myself on an old road, really a pair of tracks through the trees with tall weeds growing between them. Bloom's scent trail followed the road for more than a hundred yards before leaving it for a roofless ruin with a fallen steeple, an old church building. One cleared-out corner was littered with cigarette butts. I sniffed the filters. Bloom's oil was on some of them, but others carried a different scent, more masculine. She was meeting someone out here. I circled the structure, but her scent trail ended. She'd either gone back the way she came or someone had driven off with her. An inspection of the old road showed recent tire marks from a light vehicle, possibly an ATV. My earpiece crackled with Rusty's voice. Hey, boss, security and surveillance are good to go and Drone One is up and away. Your GPS tag is showing outside the campground. Find something? Possibly, I replied, consulting the map on the flex tablet of my suit's forearm. I'll let you know. The map showed the double track running east, hooking up with a forest service road and eventually accessing a county highway, but the freshest tire tracks didn't go that way. I followed them in the opposite direction, paralleling the fence until they left the road for a locked gate. I scaled the fence this time, landing back inside the camp. 
The tracks ran toward a small cabin beside a shed. A golf cart with all-terrain tires and a trailer hitch was parked beside it. Bingo. This was where Sarah said the maintenance man lived, and he was home. A scent of cigarette smoke drifted from the front of the cabin, along with the faint plucking of guitar strings. I radioed Sarah. Hey, could you pull up the background on Luke Dunphy? As an arm of the world's largest defense company, we had access to just about everything on everyone. One moment, she replied. I circled the rear of the cabin, alert for the missing girl's scent. At the golf cart, I picked her up on the passenger side. Hard to tell how recently, but definitely within the last week. Time to have a chat with Dunphy. I returned through the woods to the main road, then doubled back so he'd see me approaching. As the front of the cabin slid into view, he took shape, tipped back in a chair with a guitar across his lap and a cigarette in the corner of his mouth. I'd been expecting an older man, a veteran of the camp, but the head of maintenance was about my age, late twenties. Cheap tattoos spattered his lean, sun-browned arms. Luke, I called. He looked up from his strumming, not bothering to shake his sandy brown hair from his face. Depends, he asked, the cigarette bobbing beneath a wispy mustache. Who's asking? I'm Captain Wolf, I said. My team and I arrived today. Oh, right. Steve and Alice said you guys were inbound. What can I do you for, oh helmeted one? He smirked as he resumed plucking out an indistinct tune. He was irreverent in a way that probably impressed some, but from my vantage point, he looked like a 90-pound weakling. Even though I'd stopped at the bottom of the steps, I still had height on him. He was also within easy grabbing distance. Robin Bloom, I said. Do you know where she is? I watched him closely for a reaction. He pinched the cigarette from his mouth, ashes spilling down his open work shirt, and squinted from behind his hair. If I did, do you think you guys would be here? I felt my wolf rising to his challenging tone, but I calmed him back down. I know you've been meeting her at those ruins outside the fence, I said. His pulse jumped, but he gave no outward sign. Is that a crime? Were you with her on Wednesday? Nope. Haven't seen her since Saturday. I've got something, Sarah said through my earpiece. He was arrested three years ago for assault of an ex-girlfriend. She didn't press charges and his family hired a team to wipe public mentions of the arrest. Her name, I mumbled. Kate Bramblett. To this point, I'd been direct but calm, building a profile based on Dunphy's physiological responses. Under the surface, he was uneasy, but I wasn't picking up the heart palpitations or sour scent of someone cornered. I needed to push him, something I was more than happy to do after learning about his arrest. When he bent over to tune the guitar, I grabbed the front of his shirt and pinned him to a wooden pillar. The fuck? He cried in a strangled voice, legs kicking as his guitar tumbled down the steps in a series of buzzing twangs. Did Robin do something that set you off? I growled. Was she another Kate? He shook his head, hands struggling with my solid grip. With a grunt, I flung him across the yard. He came down in a floppy roll, then staggered to his feet and tried to flee in his clunky hiking boots. I landed in front of him and met him with a palm to the chest. The short blow knocked him onto the seat of his jeans shorts. He opened his mouth to shout, but only a straining gasp emerged. I lifted him under an arm, dragged him back to the porch, and sat him back on the chair. Do I have your attention now? He nodded fervently, eyes wide as saucers. Good. Let's try this again. Where were you Wednesday afternoon? In town, he wheezed. I took Steve's truck. You can ask him. Me and Betty. She's in charge of the kitchen. We went on a supply run. Didn't get back till 4.30. His face and scent suggested he was telling the truth. How many times did you and Robin meet there this summer? Five, six times. I took the cart out for some off-roading and saw her at the old church. He paused to swallow, his voice coming back. I joined her for a smoke. That was it. She said she went there most afternoons, so sometimes I'd meet her to hang out or ride around. It was never planned or anything. Did anyone else know? He shook his head. I don't think so. Did you ever see anyone else back there while off-roading? He shook his head again, his hair releasing several dead leaves he'd picked up during his tumble. What did you two talk about? Life shit, mostly. He was trying to recover his cool, but his voice carried a straining note now that he couldn't lose. 
We're both creators, so we had stuff in common. I'm into music. She's got her writing. She also makes jewelry. She never talked about ditching this place or anything. She needed the money. Recalling her missing backpack, I asked, Did she bring a backpack when she'd go there? He shook his head. Don't remember ever seeing one. Just her woven purse. You know, the kind you wear across your body? He mimed a strap. She kept some notebooks in there. I'd find her writing in them sometimes. Did she have any enemies here? If she did, she never talked about them. He glanced past me as though debating whether to say something more. Whatever you tell me doesn't leave our team, I assured him. Well, I noticed she avoided the Hanseroffs, he said in a lowered voice. The directors? Any idea why? He shrugged, still uneasy. They can be funny about the rules, and she's not as straight-laced as she looks. Girl's got a twisted sense of humor. He smiled to himself before turning serious again. That's why she started going off the grounds, I think, to get a little space from them, some breathing room. Do you know anything about the stories she told in her cabin? Not really. I mean, I knew about them. They'd sort of made her camp famous. I could see him struggling for what they had to do with her disappearance while also trying to come up with something helpful. She talked about wanting to write a story for Camp Courage, he offered. You know, a scary one. Yeah? She said the camp needed its own legend. Did she go into any details? She asked me for some ideas since I've been here the last eight years. I told her about a couple dogs that went missing. Oh, and the time the cook freaked out on her kid. Not sure what he did, but she beat him pretty badly over it. That didn't sit well with Steve and Alice, and they canned her. But I don't know if Robin used any of that material. I think she was looking for more blood and gore. You said a couple dogs went missing. What about people? He shook his head. We've had campers get homesick and arrange to be picked up, that sort of thing, but nothing like this. And you have no idea where she went? No, not even a theory. Honest to God. Satisfied he was being truthful, I retrieved his guitar from the ground and handed it back to him. He took it by the neck and leaned it against the wall beside his chair, not nearly as interested in it now. Thanks for your time, I said brusquely. When I turned to leave, he stood. Hey, you brought up Kate. I looked at him through my visor, ready for some bullshit backpedaling. I lost my temper, he said. She... Well, why it happened doesn't matter. I lost my temper. That's on me. Nothing like that has happened since. I'd appreciate it if you kept that between us, too. He looked around. I need this job. He appeared contrite, but forgiveness didn't rest with me. Stay inside your cabin tonight and keep your doors locked, I told him. If I need anything else, I'll be back. Yes, sir. The sun had set by the time I left his cabin. I had Bloom's last known whereabouts and a couple nuggets of info regarding her habits and interests. The part about her wanting to create a camp legend was interesting, but I couldn't see where it fit with anything. I was preparing to radio Rusty. I wanted him to start sifting through satellite images for any vehicles that had used the back road when the earlier sensation of being watched broke through me. I froze and scanned the surrounding trees with my lupine vision. A piercing shriek broke the spell, followed by a pair of shouts that echoed across the camp. Talk to me, guys, I radioed as I sprang into a run. Yeah, heard that too, Rusty replied. Got drone one moving in. Wait, what the heck? There's something glowing near the admin building. Heading there now, I said. Sarah, back me up. Chapter 5 As the admin building grew in my vision, I spotted a truck idling in the road, its high beams on, front doors open. Within a few more paces, I had visual contact with the glowing figure Rusty mentioned. Crap, boss. I think it's that wailing woman I told you about, he radioed. As I passed beneath the faint hum of his drone, I saw that he was right on a couple of counts. It was definitely a woman, and the unrelenting screams pegged her as a wailer, but it wasn't the one the campers had described. Instead of a white dress and wild hair, the glowing figure wore a cardigan sweater and jeans, and her copper-colored hair was short. A sharp scent of blood trailed her, though. Child's blood. She was also chasing someone into the woods, a portly man who was panting and shouting. I was almost to them when the man fell. Had to be Steve Hanseroff, the director. He and his wife must have been returning from their errands when whatever the hell this thing was attacked their truck. The woman produced a long axe. Steve thrust up his arms defensively. No, Betty, no! 
He knows her. I stopped and drew my sidearm. Loaded with composite rounds, it carried a little something for every type of supernatural we were likely to face in the field, and this glowing thing was no mortal. I sighted and squeezed. Two rounds to the heart and two more to her head. Small flashes ignited on impact, and the woman staggered forward, the descending axe landing wide. As Steve managed to scramble away, she spun toward me. In the darkness, her eyes flashed a crazy green, and my body broke out in cold goose flesh. Leading with my sidearm, I sent two shots between her eyes. Her head snapped back in a spray of spectral blood, but I couldn't seem to drop her. If this thing's carrying phantasmal energy, probably need to go full salt. I released my magazine, but before I could replace it with a salt mag, the woman vanished only to reappear behind Steve. I sprinted at her, launching myself across the final few meters as her bloodied axe came up again. Fortunately, she was solid enough for me to tackle. I hadn't been sure. We hit the ground in a roll, the woman shrieking and clawing my suit. She was surprisingly strong, and I could feel the bright rake of her nails. When we came to a stop, I was on top, my knees pinning her arms. She thrust her face toward my helmet, snapping and snarling while twisting to get back to her intended prey. Beneath the sickening scent of blood on her sweater, she reeked of brain rot. I was digging into a pouch for a salt mag when, kablam! The explosion against the back of my suit threw me forward. I peered over her shoulder to find a woman stalking toward us with a shotgun. This must have been Steve's wife, Alice. She brought the weapon up again. Hold fire, I roared. But she couldn't hear me above the woman's renewed screams. She may not have even seen me as separate from the glowing entity. I crouched as she fired again, and another shell of what felt like buckshot slammed into my protective suit. Damn it, I seethed. As my preternatural healing softened the fiery impact points, I pulled a stake from my belt and slung it toward Alice. The blunt end caught her barrel, drawing the shotgun from her grip. As it fell to the ground, I slammed the salt mag into my sidearm and began unloading rounds into the specter's face. With each impact, smoke burst up. The woman issued a final brain-bending shriek, and then her entire form disintegrated beneath me. I straightened in the ear-ringing silence, my weapon trained on the spot where she'd been before scanning our surroundings. Alice had left the gun to run toward her husband, a small flashlight beam bobbing ahead of her. I waited for Sarah, who was just arriving from our operating base. She was fully kitted, a night vision ocular glinting over one eye. When I signaled to her that the threat had been put down, she lowered her rifle. Any residue? She asked. Just smoke. Nothing collectible. I sensed the scientist in her frowning before she switched to a role as chief medic. Is anyone hurt? She called to the directors. As we approached them, Steve appeared in shock more than anything. Alice swung the flashlight beam toward us. Though I towered over the scene, she only spared me a glance before addressing Sarah. Would you tell me what in the hell is going on? She demanded. Let's get you both indoors, Sarah replied mechanically. I'm fine, Steve insisted from a couch as Sarah shined a penlight into each of his pupils. You may not be physically hurt, she explained, but there could be other ill effects. He shrugged in acceptance. He was a short man in his forties with boyish blue eyes and a blonde beard. From the neck up, he looked like a Pacific Northwest hipster but his bright green camp shirt and belted shorts suggested dorky dad. His wife, who was a couple inches taller, had more of a take-charge vibe. Where in the hell did she even come from? She demanded. We're still working to determine the source of these phenomena, Sarah replied. Phenomena? Source? Alice released a sharp laugh. That was Betty Crooms. That name again. Betty. Um, she was glowing. Steve pointed out. Alice spun on him. Because she was standing in your high beams. No, I mean after, he said meekly, but Alice was no longer listening. Betty Crooms, she muttered. I never did trust her. You remember the discrepancy with the receipts last year. That was a clerical error, Steve said. I fixed it. But she was talking over him. I told you we shouldn't have brought her back. Then it clicked. Luke Dunphy had mentioned driving into town with a Betty the day Robin Bloom went missing. Betty is your cook? I asked. Yes, Alice said earnestly, as though someone were finally coming around to her side. And you saw her just now chasing after Steve with an axe like a madwoman. She must be the one who took Robin. Oh, I do hope she didn't hurt the poor girl. Betty was at the school when we left, 
Steve pointed out. And she looked fine. Well, she clearly beat us back here, Alice shot back. Or did you miss the part where she tried to murder you? I exchanged a glance with Sarah, who had just finished capping a blood draw. We'd seen this sort of thing before. Someone whose mind refused to flex to the possibility of the supernatural. I didn't hold it against Alice. Hell, it had taken transforming into the blue wolf to convince me of such things. But the ones who resisted the loudest tended to complicate our work the most. I cleared my throat. Ma'am, I think it would be best if you joined the others at the school. You'll see for yourself that Betty is there, and it will be safer for you both. Abandon the camp? Alice said, her expression turning worried now. We'll lose our positions. Our livelihood depends on camp courage. That's true, Steve put in. And leaving would feel like abandoning Robin. Then stay inside and keep your doors locked, I said. You have our emergency frequency, right? Radio us if anything comes up. We will, he replied. And let us know if you need anything, anything at all. As I nodded back, his eyes appeared a little too earnest. It didn't take my wolf instincts to tell me he was hiding something. Chapter 6 Back at our command center, I filled in Sarah and Rusty on my outing, from tracking Bloom's scent to the burned-out church, to my meeting with Luke Dunphy and what he told me about Bloom avoiding the Hanseroffs, to my encounter with the Spectre and the effectiveness of Salt in putting her down. So that wasn't the Wailing Woman? Rusty asked from behind his monitors. Had a lot of the same traits, I said, but she took on the appearance of the cook for some reason. And it was just her, right? He asked. There wasn't anything else? No hook man, I confirmed. Okay, good, he breathed. Drone One hasn't picked up the missing gal, but I've been collecting images during the search. Once the algo stitches them together, I can run them against satellite shots from before the camp's opening this season. The algo will light up any changes between then and now. Sounds good, I said. And check the sad images for traffic on the back road, the one paralleling the fence. I want to see who's been using it. What did you find, Sarah? Possibly some relevant historical information on the area? She turned off the centrifuge unit that held Steve's blood draw and sat down at her laptop. More than 200 years ago, a tribe of the Klamath Nation used this valley as a ceremonial site. They believed a powerful god resided here and beseeched him for boons, victory in battle, the end of a drought. Every request was answered, according to their oral history, but fearful of the god, they only journeyed here when it was considered vital to their survival. They avoided the site otherwise. So we're dealing with a danged god? Rusty exclaimed. Let her finish, I growled. In the early 1900s, a cooperative farming community established themselves here, but disagreements arose with the arrival of a new pastor. Some members felt he was too obsessed with hellfire and brimstone, as one account put it. Half the community left. When a prospective member arrived later that summer, he found the settlement burned to the ground, along with the people and pastor. The epicenter of the blaze appeared to have been the church, where he described an evil smell of sulfur. The ruins where Bloom was hanging out, I said. I peered over the back of Sarah's shoulder at the yellowing image she'd accessed on her laptop. Fifty or so members of the community were standing in front of the whitewashed wooden church. With his clergy collar and pendant, the pastor was hard to miss, a wild-haired man with an intense stare. The historical record, coupled with recent events, Suggest there may be something on the camp property that makes stories come true, Sarah said. Or at least gives them form and intention, like the entity that attacked Steve Hanseroff tonight. So if I wished for a million bucks, money would start raining down on my head? Rusty asked. Sarah trained her glasses on him and replied as though he'd posed a serious question. It's impossible to answer that with any degree of confidence, not until we better understand the phenomenon. Well, be sure to let me know. So we're not necessarily looking for a prod one, I interjected. That's correct, Sarah said. The power could be contained in an artifact or perhaps a feature of the landscape. I thought about the energy my wolf nature had been reacting to since our arrival. But why now? Rusty asked, turning serious. Scary stories have been told at this camp before, right? Why are they only now coming to life? It could be a cyclical phenomenon, Sarah replied possibly related to celestial orbits, or the explanation could lie with the human agent. 
Robin Bloom may not be a proud one, but like the Klamath spiritual leaders and the community's pastor, her expressed imagination may resonate with the energy here. I thought about Bloom's reputation as a storyteller, but we were no closer to knowing what happened to her. Had she been a victim of one of her own story monsters, or was there another explanation? Echoing my thoughts, Sarah said, The honest answer is, we don't know yet. Then I think it's time we brought in the rest of the team, I said. Yuffie's more sensitive to energies than me. While he locates whatever's manifesting these things, I can focus on finding Bloom. We'll need Takara and Olaf as backup, extra salt ammo too. The Wailing Woman was only one of the tales Bloom told, and that thing wasn't easy to put down. The bandaged horror and Hookman could still turn up. Yeah, yeah, what he said, Rusty put in anxiously. I'll submit the request, Sarah said. Do you have any insights into Bloom's whereabouts? Not yet, but something's been bugging me. I turned to Rusty. When you told the story about the Wailing Woman earlier, you said she targets unfaithful men, right? That's right, boss. His eyes lit up in understanding. Wait a sec. She attacked the husband tonight. And remember how I told you guys that Bloom was avoiding the Hanseroffs? I said. Do you think something amorous occurred between Mr. Hanseroff and Bloom? Sarah asked me. No telling, but he's hiding something. I saw it in his eyes when he offered his help tonight. I also picked up Bloom's scent in his truck when I was closing it up. Staff used the truck too, so it could be nothing, but I dropped a GPS tag inside in case Steve tries to take off. Either way, Bloom's still out there. While we're waiting on the others, I want to look into a couple things and widen the search area. Do you need backup? Sarah asked. I seized my favorite weapon from our makeshift armory. It featured three barrels and a rugged outer casing, a high-caliber assault rifle, a grenade launcher, and a flamethrower. I brought the MP-88 to my shoulder, appreciating its size and heft, and sighted on the far wall before lowering it again. This'll do until the others get here, I said. Chapter 7 as I passed the administrative building, I could hear the Hanseroffs through the walls. They were still arguing over the identity of the being who'd attacked them. Only now Steve was being just as hostile, if not more so. Because your theory is stupid, he said. Like half the things you do and say. Funny how much a person changed when they thought they weren't being observed. And believing in ghosts isn't? Alice countered. Anyway, how could Betty be a ghost if she's not dead? You want to know what's really stupid? Spending a thousand dollars on a mower that needs to be fixed every other day. Well, what about the cost of you misspelling courage on our t-shirts? He shot back. I lingered for several moments, but they'd moved on to criticizing each other's management decisions. Bloom's name never came up. For now, the important thing was that they were staying put. From their place, I headed to Cabin B, where I was greeted by a mess of unmade bunks and the scattered belongings of a dozen young campers told to pack only their essentials. Bloom's end of the cabin, with its neatly made twin, was the one area of calm. A search of the adjacent closet turned up clothes and toiletries, but none of the notebooks Dunphy had mentioned. Not even pens. I pictured someone cramming everything into her missing backpack. Bloom herself or someone else. Various scents lingered in her area of the cabin, including the Hanseroffs, which was expected. But I also picked up Luke Dunphy's, a fairly fresh scent, too, which wasn't so expected. He claimed he hadn't seen her in days. Repair work? Or had he been here for other reasons? Hackles stiffening, I spun toward the door, but I was reacting to the energy in the camp again, the same energy Sarah believed was giving life to the stories. It felt more concentrated in the cabin. I sniffed high and low, but like with Sarah's instrument, I couldn't find anything, as though the energy were more a lingering imprint than an actual presence. I'd have Yuffie check it out when he arrived with the others. By the time I returned outside, the moon had edged higher and thick clouds were moving in. My nose told me rain wasn't far behind. That was going to complicate the tracking. I made a circuit of the camp, confirming that none of Bloom's trails left the enclosure save the one to the old church. I then spent the next hours roaming the grounds, my lupine mind constructing a map of her movements. She'd made repeated trips to a row of bear-proof trash receptacles, empty now. Part of her duties, probably, but I noted the spot's remoteness. Trees walled it off from the rest of the camp, and a road dead-ended here. Hey, boss, 
Rusty radioed. The team's a few minutes out. Good. I'll listen for them. Finding anything on those images? Yup. That's the other reason I rang. The algo picked up some disturbed ground that wasn't on last week's sats, just past the north end of that field. Could be nothing, but looks like someone's been playing gopher. Okay, I'll go there now. As I trotted down the road toward the activities field, my gut clenched at the thought of finding Bloom's remains. But if she were decomposing, I would have picked that up the instant we arrived. There were no strong blood scents either. If she'd been attacked by one of her story creations, it hadn't been in the camp. By the time I reached the field, a foggy drizzle had descended. I was crossing the damp grass when I spun suddenly, instincts anticipating the attack a moment before something large and hairy slammed into me. Caught off balance, I went to the ground. A blunt head came in, and I smashed a forearm against its growling neck. A rotting muzzle snapped at my visor, spattering it with saliva. The hell is this thing? One of the creature's eyes was stoved in, and scraps of flesh hung from its face. A zombie dog? The thing hadn't charged. I would have heard it. Hell, I would have smelled it. It had simply materialized. I was tensing to thrust the creature off me when I noticed a dog tag dangling over my forearm. The rusted tag read, Rocky, with a phone number underneath. Now I did thrust him off, but it took effort. The dog landed a short distance away, his massive paws displacing turf as he wheeled to face me. I'd battled reanimated dogs before, but regardless of the tag, this hadn't been someone's pet. Dogs weren't bred this big. Rocky stalked back and forth, back hunched, looking for an opening. As I brought my MP-88 to my shoulder, I noted the bands of flesh cut from the creature's ribs, and that's when it clicked. You overhead, Russ, I radioed. Yes, sir, he responded distractedly. What in Sam Hill? Yeah, I think I just stepped into the bandaged horror story. Let me know if any others show up. Rusty's confirmation was buried under an eruption of barking as the dog broke toward me. A low growl shook my own throat, an urge to pry off my helmet and fight him as the blue wolf surging inside me. I stood firm instead and squeezed off a series of shots. Salt rounds broke through his head, releasing blooms of dark smoke. But this thing was more resilient than the wailing woman. Though he listed and staggered, he kept coming, monstrous teeth bared. It took a sustained stream of auto-fire to finish him off. Rocky broke apart, his smoke joining the sinister fog growing over the field. I was stepping through the spent shell casings, surveying my surroundings, when something heavy landed on my back and sank its teeth in the tender spot where my right shoulder met my neck. You've got another one, Rusty radioed. Yeah, thanks, I grunted, seizing its scruff. Even through my suit's protection, I could feel the strength of the creature's jaw. But when I flexed my arm to pull it off me, a wad of rotten flesh came away instead. With a grunt of disgust, I jumped up and came down on my back. Though this wasn't an actual dog, the feeling of it crunching under me shook my dog-loving nature. The creature didn't relent, though, its bite continuing to grip my shoulder. I worked my talons under its upper teeth. If its jaw was as flimsy as the rest of it, I could snap it away but its canines snagged on my glove's material and the entire jaw closed around my hand. I can work with that too. I pulled my hand free, leaving the creature holding my glove. Conscious of my dwindling salt ammo, I fired a pair of grenade rounds into the creature at point-blank range. The rounds thudded through its chest, blasting back out as fire, salt, and chunks of canine. I shook off the last, but the dog's remains were already sublimating. A set of headlights sliced into view, shining through the rising smoke. The cavalry's here, Rusty announced. I lowered my weapon and waved the armored van over. Takara was the first one out, her sleek midnight hair and black leathers glistening in the headlights. As she panned the field with an M4 rifle, fiery red crescents grew around her irises, hinting at her dragon nature. Yuffie followed in his hooded coat, magic warping the bladed end of his long staff. Long time no see, Mr. Wolf, he said with a giggle, something he did often, and often for no good reason. But I raised a hand, glad to see him too. Glad to see all of them. Anything, Russ? I radioed. Nothing, but these things seem to drop out of nowhere. Yeah, tell me about it, I thought, rotating my shoulder where a ghost of bruising remained. I reclaimed my glove and briefed the new arrivals, including Olaf, who'd been driving. Our zombie-like teammate lumbered from the van, 
fully kitted and bearing an M4 like Takara's. Our objective is a patch of disturbed earth at the north end of the field, I finished. After we check it out, we'll regroup back at base. We started forward, my teammates falling into formation. Hey, boss, Rusty radioed again. You've got something approaching on your three. The four of us pivoted as the air turned foul with putrefaction. Yuffie's next giggle was sharp with nerves as a large figure appeared through the trees. Not a giant canine this time. A person. A bandaged horror? But the hulking figure wasn't festooned in wrappings. A sack with eye holes covered his head, and he wore a long, rotting coat. Beyond the right sleeve, a cruel arc of metal glinted. Oh, crap, Rusty whimpered. Chapter 8 Center of mass, I ordered. Sustained assault till he smoke. Takara and Olaf opened fire with their rifles, stitching the hookman's torso with salt rounds. The assault stalled him, but he resumed his forward march, jittering with the subsequent impacts, and the smoke coming off him was scant, much less than what I'd seen with the wailing woman or dogs. I went straight to my grenade launcher. The first golf ball-sized rounds produced wet explosions from his billowing coat. He peered down as though assessing the damage, then broke into a lumbering charge. Olaf and Takara attacked his damaged torso while I hammered him with more grenade rounds. Though he staggered this way and that, his form held together. Our attack wasn't having a cumulative effect. When he'd come to within 40 yards, I switched to the flamethrower. A jet of pressurized napalm roared from my weapon's nozzle and slammed into him, lighting him up like a torch. I coated him, thoroughly. The instant I broke off, though, the flames thinned into a billowing cloud of foul smoke. God dang, Rusty exclaimed. It's like one of them freaking horror flicks. He just keeps coming. Want me to introduce him to some mini stingers? Stand by, I replied. Yuffie, hit him with a Kembo. Let's see how he responds to a god's attack first, I thought. Yes, Mr. Wolf, Yuffie answered from behind me. I had tried for months to train the mister out of him, but unsuccessfully. His tribe of origin considered it a term of respect and endearment. Yuffie started into a chant, gathering underworld energy to his staff's stone blade. The atmosphere around us turned warm and humid while a graveyard chill shook my insides. With a shouted word, he released the energy as a spiraling bolt. It impacted at the hook man's feet, swallowing him in a funnel of black smoke. He moaned and slashed his blade, battling the host of underworld creatures that morphed in and out of the attack. And then he disappeared. Did that finish him? Takara asked, panning our surroundings. I followed the guttering line of napalm to where the hook man had been standing. A dark cloud hovered there now, but I didn't trust it. It wasn't the smoke of dispersion I'd seen with the others. Yes, he did not care for Dabu, Yuffie said proudly, referring to the underworld god from whom he drew his power. But Dabu did not care for him very much either. He said he smelled like a pile of doo-doo. Yuffie's ensuing giggle turned into a broken gargle. I spun. The hook man had manifested behind him. The thick arm he clenched around Yuffie's throat lifted him from the ground while the hook was coming up and under to empty his guts. I fired, twice. The salt rounds whistled past Yuffie's head and plunked into the eye holes of the hook man's sack mask, rocking back his head and emitting bursts of fire. He released Yuffie and vanished again. Stay alert! I called to the others as I rushed in to help my teammate to his feet. You okay? Yes, Mr. Wolf, he said, fear rattling his voice as he rubbed his throat. I guess he does not care for Yuffie either. Takara, I called. I'd caught the shimmer a moment before the hook man took form in front of her. In the next instant, he was swinging his scythe-like hook at her neck, but he'd picked the wrong member of Legion. With instincts honed from years of ninjutsu training, Takara ducked under the attack and sliced a leg around catching the hook man behind the ankles. He went down hard on his ass. Takara was already above him, a silver-edged blade popping from the right sleeve of her leathers and extending past her retracted fist. With a grunt, she drove it into the hook man's throat. His arms and legs kicked up as the blade cleaved bone, sinew, and then the ground beneath him. She twisted hard and withdrew the blade as fiercely as she'd driven it home, leaping back. The hook man fell still her attack appearing to have inflicted permanent damage. Way to go, tea cakes! Rusty shouted over the radio. I mean, Takara! 
As her eyes narrowed, the rest of us advanced with our weapons. The hookman's severed neck wasn't reconstituting itself. I ejected my salt mag and slammed home one loaded with silver rounds. Stand back, I said. I emptied the magazine into him. Rounds tore away his mask, revealing a horribly scarred face, before reducing him to a messy corpse. He sublimated, rising away into the kind of mist that assured me he was truly gone this time. You found the key, I told Takara. He's more susceptible to silver than salt. Maybe all the manifestations were, but they weren't the end game. The manifesting source was, as well as finding Bloom. As rain began to fall, I jerked my head. Come on, let's check out that disturbed earth. Rusty had tagged the location on my map, and I spotted it the moment we entered the thin swath of trees. Pine needles carpeted the ground, save for one area where the needles lay haphazardly over a mound. I removed my helmet and sniffed the area, but the rain had cleaned away the human odors. With my teammates standing guard, I set my MP-88 down and began to dig. My large talons, coupled with the loose dirt, made the work go quickly. Before long, I hit compacted earth. By the time I removed the loose dirt, the hole measured roughly three feet wide and two deep. It was empty, though, nothing buried inside. I sifted the earth in my palm and held it to my nose. Traces of bloom. Also the plastic scent of a polymer fabric. I straightened. The missing girl's backpack was in here. Yuffie let out a low, ooh, while Olaf merely grunted. Where is it now? Takara asked. A few scenarios played out in my head, but one in particular. The person who'd buried the pack decided it wasn't concealed well enough and relocated it, possibly when they learned a special unit was en route. I paced over to a nearby outbuilding and tore away the padlock and hasp. As I'd guessed, it was an equipment shed. A pair of shovels hung from nails on the near wall, one caked with dried earth. I sniffed the blade, then the handle. The earth matched what I'd just dug through, complete with Bloom's sweat embedded in polymer fabric. Several human scents covered the handle, but one stood out for its strength. Son of a bitch, I muttered. It belonged to the director. Steve Hanseroff. Chapter 9 Back at our base of operations, we unloaded the van the three had arrived in. More weapons, ammo, a second drone for Rusty, and sacks of salt, which we used to ring the cabin as further protection against spectral entities. You guys were briefed on the way here, I said as we met around the table, and you saw firsthand what's out there. I want everyone packing silver, salt, and composite rounds. With any engagement, start with silver and progress from there. We're going to split into three units. Takara, I want you supporting Yuffie while he locates the energy source. Our magic-using priest had removed his helmet and was smoking a thick cigar, one of his god's preferred offerings. A rank-smelling plume floated above his grinning teeth and head of elaborate cornrows. Anything yet? I asked him. Oh, yes, Dabu feel the energy strongly here, he said. Very strongly. Does he have any useful insights? I asked, stressing the word useful. Yuffie finished a swig of brandy from his flask, another of his god's preferred offerings. It is not coming from a being. This he knows. And he's not afraid of it? Yuffie laughed. Of this? No, no, Mr. Wolf. He is not afraid. I nodded, only half reassured. Yuffie's god had a history of turning tail when we needed him the most. Olaf, you're going to stay here with Rusty, providing security. Our Polish soldier turned zombie regarded me with his dead eyes. It could take a moment for commands to imprint inside his scarred head, but once there, he was as solid as they came. He nodded. I turned to Rusty, parked behind his fortress of monitors. How we doing on the images? No hits for vehicles on the back road, he replied but I finally got the AI to ID Bloom from the bird's eye. At least I think I did. Still teaching the dang thing. He slammed his keyboard a couple times. Anyway, it's going through the old sap photos now, building me a file of possible hits. I'll let you know if there's anything good on them. Please do, I said, donning my helmet. Sarah and I are going to the admin building to have another talk with the Hansaroffs. Everyone has their assignments. Be smart. Whatever's given life to the things attacking the camp can give life to them again. Even the hook, man, I said before Rusty could ask. 
Well, Olaf's got my back, he said nervously. Right, big guy? Olaf grunted dully and lumbered to the armory to fill his magazine pouches. As Sarah checked the chamber on her M4, she asked, Do you really think the Hanseroffs know where Bloom is? One of them might, I growled. I pounded on the door hard enough to shake the entire admin building. Steve answered a moment later with wide, questioning eyes. His wife, Alice, stood a short distance behind him. I could see she'd been crying. Is something wrong? He asked us. You offered your help earlier, I said, struggling not to growl. We need it. His lips stammered for a moment as though he hadn't actually expected us to follow through. Well, yeah, of course, of course. What is it? I nodded at the pair of salt sacks I'd carried with us and dropped on the porch. I'm going to ring your building with one of these. I need you to take the other one and pour out extra lines across your thresholds and window sills. It's protection against what attacked you earlier. Sure, sure, I'm on it. He was already stepping into a pair of hiking boots and pulling a rain jacket from a rack, clearly relieved we hadn't come for other reasons. Can I do anything? Alice asked from inside. That was Sarah's cue. Let's go to your bedroom, she said. I examined Steve earlier, but I think it would be prudent to examine you as well. Why? Did you find something? She asked. I'll explain inside, Sarah replied formally. Her study of Steve's blood had turned up nothing. The proposed exam was just an excuse to get me alone with her husband. As Alice conceded, he joined me outside and closed the door behind Sarah. He squinted past the porch light's glow to the rain that was coming down heavy now. Boy, it's really squalling out there. When I didn't respond, he stooped for one of the sacks. Guess we should get started. Any developments in your search for Robin? I drew my combat knife and stabbed it into the end of his sack. He dropped it with a sharp yelp and jumped back. W what's going on here? As I sheathed the knife, I nodded at the puncture. You need an opening to pour the salt. He stared at it before laughing nervously. Right, sorry. Guess I'm a little jumpy from everything that's happened. Why don't you tell me about your part in it? He started to stoop again, hesitated, then proceeded. What do you mean? He grunted as he cradled the sack in his arms. I'd been stalling until I was certain Alice was in the bedroom, but Steve had already shown his hand. He couldn't play innocent for shit. Though my heart was pounding at the thought of him harming an innocent girl, I spoke evenly, even mildly. Under the right circumstances, that could be more threatening than shouting. Of course, having my MP-88 in hand didn't hurt. We have satellite images of you burying Bloom's backpack. I informed him. He laughed in equal parts fake surprise and fake indignation. Where? There's no backpack buried anywhere in this camp. Man, he was really bad at playing innocent. I know. I stepped toward him. Because we also have images of you digging it up again. The satellite story was a lie, but easier than trying to tell him I'd smelled the same evidence. Salt was spilling from his sack in a steady hiss, but he didn't seem to notice. His eyes flicked toward the activities field. When I kept my visor fixed on his face, he forced a laugh and shook his head. Oh, I get it. He licked a worried smile. You're striking out, so you need someone to pin the disappearance on. I deactivated the modulator on my helmet. I'm through fucking around, I said in a voice so low and guttural I sensed it reducing his bowels to a quivering mass. Where is she? I, I don't know. With my next step, I backed him against the wall. Where is she? I repeated, full animal. All right, look, he said in a desperate whisper. I ditched her backpack, but I don't know where she is. I swear, I had nothing to do with that. We'd apparently reached the compromise stage because I was finally hearing some truth. Where's the pack, then? I dropped it into a ravine. I, I can take you to it, he added helpfully. If you have nothing to do with Robin Bloom's disappearance, why did you ditch it? He glanced toward the door of the building he shared with his wife. Can I tell you on the way there? Chapter 10 I tried to kiss her, Steve Hanseroff said. Robin, I asked. Wiper slapped at the heavy rain as he steered us from the campground in his truck. 
I'd elected to let him drive, and I was escorting him solo so as not to reshuffle the team. There was nothing he could do to me as the Blue Wolf, and that included trying to drive us off the ravine in which he claimed to have dropped the pack. Yeah, he confessed with a shake of his head. I know she's young, but we've always clicked, and I don't know. At the start of the summer, she seemed really into me. I had this crazy notion it could work, and there was this moment by the trash receptacles. He gave his head another rueful shake. I misread the situation. She's 19, I growled, and you're married. Yeah, well, things haven't been so sunny in paradise, he said testily. Maybe you noticed the way she is with me. And you with her. Do you always call her stupid? He looked over at me in amazement. Is there anything you haven't seen or heard around here? So why did you hide the pack? After the attempted kiss, I apologized to Robin up and down, told her it would never happen again, that it wouldn't impact her employment at the camp in any way whatsoever. I didn't even ask her not to tell anyone. Big of you, I muttered. But I see her writing in her notebooks all the time, and when she disappeared... You thought if she'd recorded what happened, you'd become a suspect and your wife would find out, I said. So you loaded everything potentially incriminating into her backpack and buried it. He nodded in admission. When I heard you guys were coming, I dug it back up. Not just to hide it again, he added hastily. I was thinking there could be a clue in one of her notebooks about what happened to her. Yeah, I should have thought of that first, but I panicked. Anyway, I found a journal, but it was mostly random thoughts, future plans, that sort of thing. Not a day-by-day -day account, including what happened with me at the trash containers. I think she has a crush on Luke, though. Your maintenance man. Yeah, he said a little bitterly. I remembered his scent around her bed, which still bothered me. He said he had an alibi. He does, Steve confirmed. He took the truck out with Betty. That's the cook? And no, regardless of my wife's ravings, Betty had nothing to do with Robin's disappearance. If there was nothing about you in her journal, why didn't you turn it over? I couldn't very well run up to you guys and say, hey, look what I found, without looking guilty as sin. He had a point. What were in the other notebooks? Drawings, poems, stories? I just flipped through them. And you're telling me... Everything, I growled. Everything I can think of. If not, just ask more questions and I'll answer as honestly as I can. I watched him until he returned his gaze to the rain-swept road. Though his story lined up with his physiological cues, I couldn't shake the feeling he was withholding something. Several minutes later, he pulled onto the shoulder of a short bridge. I got out right here, he said. Dropped it straight down where the brush is thickest. I held out a hand. Keys. Though he was cooperating, I didn't trust him not to panic and take off. I'd tagged the vehicle, but I didn't want to have to chase him down. He was my ride back to camp. With a nod, he pulled the keys from the ignition, but hesitated. Are you going to tell anyone about this? He asked. That depends on what we find. Snatching the keys away, I stepped into the pounding rain and looked over the guardrail to gauge where the pack would have landed. I then circled the rail and made my way down the steep slope, entering trees and soon thick undergrowth. The backpack had ended up between a pair of stones and a shallow creek. I lifted the dripping pack, already knowing the notebooks inside were soaked through. Damn it. Steve looked surprised when I returned. That fast? I followed my nose. I grunted, handing him back his keys and setting the pack between my feet. He glanced guiltily at the pool spreading from the pack before cranking the engine and wheeling back toward camp. Do you think anything in there will be useful to your investigation? We'll see, I said, but I had something else on my mind at the moment. Luke mentioned a couple dogs went missing from the camp in years past. Do you remember their names? Yeah, Buster and Rocky. Why? Rocky. That had been on the tag of that first canine monstrosity. He also said you fired a former cook for beating her kid, I asked. Hilda? Yeah, her boy had gone into the lake without telling her, but it wasn't just the beating. She was holding a paring knife when it happened, and she sliced his wrist pretty bad. I don't think she meant to, but we couldn't keep her on after that. Her kid was a sad case to begin with. Burned badly in a car fire that killed his father. As he gestured to his face, 
I remembered the sight of the hook man's burned flesh when my gunfire had ripped apart his mask. I also thought about how the wailing woman had resembled their current cook, Betty. Is that information important? he asked. Maybe not, but it could explain what we've been seeing. The more important objectives were finding Bloom and the Source, which I thought of now with a capital S, our opponent, this mission. I accessed the map on my flex tablet and brought up my teammates' positions. Sarah was still in the admin building, Olaf and Rusty were at base, and it looked as if Takara and Yuffie were near the boathouse. I radioed Yuffie. How's it going? Yes, I believe Dabu has found the Source, he shouted above the hammering rain, but it is under the lake. Can you access it? I asked. We are trying. He broke into a burst of Congolese. I didn't need to understand a word to know he was in a heated debate with his god, likely over what kind of tribute would suffice to enlist his help. But the source's location explained why it had been so hard for Sarah and I to detect. Give him anything he wants, I said. Centurion's paying. At that moment, Sarah broke in. Jason, do you copy? I'm here, what's up? Mrs. Hansaroff is gone. Say again. She asked to use the bathroom. When she'd been away 15 minutes, I checked on her, but she didn't answer. I forced the door open and found the bathroom empty and the window open. She's not in the building. Sounds of struggle? I asked. None. Have you alerted Rusty? Yes, he's searching for her now. All right. We've got the backpack and should be back within 10. Copy that. What's going on? Steve asked. Is there any reason your wife would have fled? Fled? What do you mean? As I shared with him what Sarah had told me, I watched his face blanch. Oh, shit, he muttered. What? I didn't tell you the whole story, he sighed. That day I tried to kiss Robin. I think Alice saw us. Yeah, she was driving up in the truck to collect the garbage. She never said anything, but when Robin disappeared, she started rattling off these crazy theories for what happened, like she was trying to convince herself and anyone who'd listen. I got her to settle down before you guys came, but the attack tonight set her off again. Sensing we were getting to what he'd been withholding, I stayed silent. I didn't just hide the pack to protect myself. He paused, as though knowing there was no taking back what he was about to say. I did it for Alice, too. You think she's responsible for Robin's disappearance? God, I hope not, he said sickly. Chapter 11 Steve skidded the truck to a stop in front of the admin building and threw his door open, already shouting his wife's name. I grabbed my MP-88 from the back and chased him down. He'd circled to the rear of the building where the bathroom window was still open, its light illuminating a rectangle of sodden leaves. Alice! He shouted, hands to the sides of his mouth. The heavy rain had already washed away her scent. That would mean a lot more work to track her, if I even could now. When Steve started to run into the trees, I grabbed his arm. Hey, we've got a drone armed with infrared searching for her. You'll be safer in the cabin until we recover her. No, uh-uh, I can't leave her out there. His attempt to struggle from my grip wasn't a token effort. He was determined to find her. Come on, Steve, we... Let go of me, damn it! His face snapped toward mine, rain pouring off his hood. Whatever she might have done, I'm responsible. I can't leave her alone out there with those monsters! His crazed stare suggested that getting him to comply would involve throwing him over a shoulder. I had another idea. All right, but you're not going out alone. We'll get Sarah and the three of us will head back to base. We'll give you better ammo and pair you with someone on our team. A spark of reason took hold in his eyes, and he nodded fervently. A few minutes later, we were filing into our base, dripping wet. I'd radioed Olaf his orders. With a grunt, he led Steve to the armory to outfit him with salt shells. Anything yet? I asked Rusty. On the missus? Nothing for now. Her head start must have put her under tree cover. But check this out. He waved me over to a monitor he'd been studying. It was a shot of the camp taken from above, several dozen people in miniature out and about. Snapped the day Bloom went missing, he said. Not only that, it was snapped inside the time frame she went missing, ten past one. And look. He tapped a small red box that bracketed a figure on the trail circling the lake. The AI says this is Bloom, and she's aimed away from the camp. Probably going to her spot at the old church, I said, leaning closer. 
Yeah, but here's the thing. I found another shot from an hour later, and look. She's nowhere in that grid area. She either hightailed it out of there or something grabbed her. She never shows up again. And no traffic on that back road? I asked, to be sure. Not a lick. Olaf and Steve reappeared from the armory. We go now, Olaf said. If you find Mrs. Hanseroff, detain her and bring her back to the admin building, I instructed him. We'll need to talk to her. Unharmed, right? Steve asked earnestly. Olaf looked to me for confirmation, and I nodded. Unharmed. As the door closed behind them, I set Bloom's wet pack on the table. Sarah came over, and together we inspected the contents. Her notebooks were stuck together, but not as soaked through as I'd feared. I'll apply heated air, Sarah said, already setting up the cabin's portable fan and space heater. As she arrayed the notebooks in front of them, she asked, do you believe Mrs. Hanseroff is involved? There's something weird going on with her, with them. But I think Mr. Hanseroff's come clean. Her role remains to be seen. I'm still struggling with why she ran off. Perhaps we'll find evidence in the notebooks. Steve already looked through her journal, I said. Nothing in there incriminated either one of them, at least according to him. He barely glanced at her creative notebooks, though. My gut's telling me they hold a clue. A tiny fold appeared between Sarah's eyes. In what way? Gut instincts were as foreign to her as Mandarin, but she appeared more curious than skeptical. She was working on a scary camp legend when she went missing, I said. We already know the energies here were manifesting the urban legends, the wailing woman, the bandaged horror, the hook man, but the entities we faced tonight didn't line up with those stories. Not neatly. Maybe for the sake of continuity, she was changing the legends into a story that better fit Camp Courage. Sarah stared at me, no indication that she agreed or disagreed. Luke Dunphy told her that a pair of dogs went missing from the camp, I continued. And tonight, one of the bandaged horror canines was wearing one of their tags. Dunphy also told her that a former cook had been fired for beating her child. And tonight, the wailing woman looked like the current cook. Having never met the old cook, Bloom may have based her description on this Betty. But how does that relate to her disappearance? Sarah interrupted. What if she included a counselor's disappearance in her story? I said, nodding at the notebooks. And what if that counselor ended up being her? Wouldn't you have sensed her during your search? Her remains, yeah. But not if she'd been abducted, and definitely not if she'd been taken to another plane. Sarah nodded studiously. I thought of the bird's eye image of Bloom that Rusty had just shown me, there one moment and then vanished within the hour. An entity could have manifested and disappeared with her, never leaving a trace. We'd encountered such things before, but then a worrying thought struck me. If she is in an alternate plane, I said, would neutralizing the source risk trapping her there? Sarah considered the idea before nodding. It's possible. We should proceed carefully. I radioed Yuffie. Hey, how are you doing? We still cannot access the source, and not because Dabu is being difficult. It is under the ground as well as the water. But if we surround the lake with lingos, Dabu says he can wrap it like the leaves around a cassava loaf and keep the energy from the camp. He lowered his voice. I have promised him some rare cigars for this. Not a problem. How long to set that up? I will have to bury special stones at six points around the lake. If Takara can fly me, it will not take long. Does that work for you, Takara? Flying meant tapping into her incendiary dragon nature, which wasn't always pleasant for her. Yes, she replied. All right, go ahead and set them up, but wait for us to give the go-ahead before enclosing the source. Understood? Yes, Mr. Wolf, Yuffie replied. I updated Sarah, who was delicately turning the pages of a notebook beneath her hovering glasses. Rusty, meanwhile, was studying the drone two feet, infrared spots glowing here and there on his screen. I'm seeing a lot of deer, he said, but no Mrs. Hans are off yet. I consulted the monitor that showed our positions. Olaf was moving east from the admin building, presumably with Steve, while Takara and Yuffie were making their first pass across the lake. I clenched a fist. We needed a damned lead on Bloom. You were right, Sarah called from the table. There are notes in here for the story. She was combining elements from the urban legends with the camp's history, as well as her imagination. She started a draft that she intended to read to her cabin. Let's hear it, I said, my ears pricking up.
Chapter 12 Camp Dread, The Beginning, by Robin Bloom The story I'm about to tell you was told to me by a man named Crazy Stan. He was in charge of maintenance at Camp Courage before Luke. I'm calling it a story, but it's really a warning, so listen carefully. The story is about Tommy Wartman, who was born in a town not far from here. He was a sweet baby, and his mother Hilda loved him dearly. His father loved him too, but he had a problem with horse gambling, and as Mr. Wartman's debts grew, so did his distance from his family. By the time Tommy was two, Mr. Wartman's losses were so great that he was faced with having to sell their home and his small business. He'd also become a heavy drinker. One night, as he was driving home from the racetrack to confess everything to his wife, he spotted a small building at the end of a dirt road in the middle of nowhere. Through the mist, a neon sign flashed the word, Bar. Though the building looked old and weathered, he couldn't remember seeing it before. He almost kept going, but at the last moment he turned down the road, telling himself he would just have one drink. The place was empty, the few chairs and tables covered in dust. A single light shined above the bar, but that was empty too, as was the lone bottle on the shelf, not only dry but hanging with cobwebs. Hello, Mr. Wartman called. He was about to leave when a man rose from behind the wooden bar. He was very thin, with smooth skin and a mane of pitch black hair, though he also seemed very old, somehow. He rose beneath the lone light and stood there, grinning as though he'd been expecting Mr. Wartman. Hello, friend, he said in a whispery voice. What are you drinking? Mr. Wartman didn't like his voice, but he'd never needed a drink more badly in his life. Whiskey, he said, taking a stool. The bartender grinned. Very good, friend. The bartender produced a large shot glass from beneath the counter, then gripped the bottle Mr. Wartman had thought was empty. The drink seemed to smoke when the bartender poured it out, and it was tinted red. When Mr. Wartman drank it, though, he found it to be the best-tasting whiskey he'd ever had. Another? the bartender asked, the bottle poised over his glass. Mr. Wartman started to nod, but realizing he only had a few dollars in his pocket, stopped and shook his head. Better not. He suddenly felt like he shouldn't be there. I should settle up and head home. Money problems? the bartender asked. Mr. Wartman gave a sad laugh. You could say that. The bartender tilted his head sympathetically, and before Mr. Wartman knew what he was doing, all of his gambling and debt woes were pouring out of him. When he finished, the bartender smiled broadly. You've come to the right place, he said. What do you mean? Mr. Wartman asked. The bartender proceeded to tell him that he had a secret method for picking horses, and he would share it in exchange for Mr. Wartman's soul. As you might have guessed, the bartender was a demon. But Mr. Wartman didn't believe in demons, so he agreed, and the bartender shared his secret. The deal was that once Mr. Wartman had earned enough to settle his debts, he would return to the bar to relinquish his soul. They sealed the deal with a handshake, the bartender waving away his attempts to pay for his drink. I'll take my payment when the time comes, the bartender said. One way or another. And with those parting words, his smile didn't seem so friendly anymore. Even so, Mr. Wartman thought the whole thing was a joke. With what little cash he could scrape together, he employed the bartender's method the next day. What did he have to lose? And his horses won. He bet larger and larger amounts, winning more and more. He started paying down his debts. He even stopped drinking, his sudden change of fortune all the intoxication he needed. His agreement with the bartender became a dim memory, one he thought he'd dreamt. He couldn't even remember where the bar had been because he no longer saw it on his drive home. Before long, Mr. Wartman won enough to pay off his final debt. He left the track early that night to take his wife out to dinner. But on his way home, the weathered building with the neon sign appeared at the end of the dirt road, and he remembered his bargain. Though a powerful force told him to turn, he kept driving. That night at dinner, he promised his wife his gambling and drinking days were done. With his debts paid off, he planned to buy them a bigger house. For her part, Mrs. Wartman was just happy to see her husband back to his old self. 
But late that night they were awakened by screams. They rushed to their son's nursery to find his crib in flames. They got Tommy out and raced him to the hospital in time, but it took six months for his burns to heal, and he returned home horribly scarred. Tommy had also changed in other ways. He no longer cried, but he didn't laugh or smile either. The eyes that stared from his warped face were eerie voids. You see, Mr. Wartman had failed to surrender his own soul, so the demon claimed his son's. As Tommy grew up, he became fascinated with knives and sharp objects, and when he was old enough to go out alone, he would come back spattered in blood. Mrs. Wartman found the mangled bodies of birds and squirrels in the yard, but she buried them quietly. She still loved her son very much and felt very protective toward him. However, when neighbors began to report cats missing, she knew he needed help. She appealed to her husband, but to no avail. He had returned to the racetrack to pay off the hospital bills, but the bartender's method no longer worked. He went back to his losing ways and his drinking. In his heart, he knew his son's condition was his fault. He would drive all night, searching for the mysterious bar to offer his soul for his sons, but it was too late. The demon had gotten what he wanted. And then one night, Mr. Wartman kept driving, never to be seen by his family again. Creditors took the house and business and most of their possessions, leaving Mrs. Wartman to fend for herself and Tommy. Thinking her husband had left them for another woman, Mrs. Wartman would hold that against him for the rest of her life and beyond. But we'll get to that later. Mrs. Wartman took a job at a motel, and she and Tommy moved into one of the rooms. She kept her son locked in the bathroom during the day while she cleaned. It broke her heart, but she couldn't afford a sitter, much less professional help. When a summer position as head cook opened up at Camp Courage, she jumped at the chance, thinking the time out in nature would be good for Tommy. She bandaged her son's head to hide his scars and bound his hands to prevent him from holding sharp objects. The other kids kept their distance, calling him Bandage Boy, and that hurt Mrs. Wartman, but Tommy seemed content to explore the grounds on his own. And when he returned, she was happy to see that his bindings were intact and there was no blood on him. What Mrs. Wartman didn't know was that Tommy was growing smarter. He'd learned to free the bindings with his teeth and refasten them, and after his killings, he would clean the blood off in Courage Lake. He never stole knives from the kitchen because he knew his mother counted them. Instead, he found an old mower in the maintenance shed, broke off a rusted blade, and filed it to a cruel edge. Due to a drowning the previous summer, the lake area was closed to campers, and in the boathouse, Tommy found a hidden trap door. It led to a basement, and this became his torture chamber. He arranged his animal carcasses like trophies, but very soon he hungered for larger prey. There were three dogs in the camp, Rocky, Buster, and Kip. Everyone loved them, and that made Tommy want to hurt them even more. After all, that was what demons did, twist lightness and joy into insufferable darkness and pain. He first lured Rocky to the boathouse and then Buster, and that was the end of them, though some still claimed to see the dog's rotting remains stalking the campground late at night. Driven mad by their pain and mutilation, the two dogs think everyone looks like Tommy, and they attack on sight. So, if you're ever out after curfew and you hear a low growl or catch a whiff of rotting flesh, run to your cabin immediately and pray you'll be fast enough. The camp searched everywhere for the two missing dogs, but only Tommy knew what had happened to them. To inflict even more pain, he left parts of the dogs around the camp for people to find. And though the horror on their faces delighted the demon in him, he noticed that the camp had begun to watch him more closely, especially the counselors. Tommy waited for Friday night storytelling at the fire circle before going after Kip. What he didn't know was that his mother had been asked to chop more wood for the event, as she walked to the woodpile with an axe, she spied Tommy luring Kip toward the boathouse, his unbound hand gripping the lawnmower blade. All this time, Mrs. Wartman had been telling herself that Tommy hadn't hurt those poor dogs, but here was the truth in front of her. And this knowledge broke her heart and mind. She ran at him, screaming madly, which caused Kip to flee. 
Furious at being denied his kill, Tommy turned the lawnmower blade on his mother. Mrs. Wartman brought the axe around in self-defense. The handle caught the lawnmower blade, but the head came down on Tommy's wrist, cutting his hand clean away. His cries alerted a group of counselors who rushed toward them. Thinking the counselors were coming for him, Tommy fled toward his hideout. But seeing he was leaving a blood trail, he veered onto the dock and jumped into the lake. The counselors hadn't been coming for Tommy, though. When they saw the axe in Mrs. Wartman's hands, the blood on her sweater, and Tommy's severed hand on the ground, they put that together with the mutilated dogs. Some of the counselors picked up stones while others picked up sticks, and with them, they beat poor Mrs. Wartman to death. According to some, her ghost lives on at Camp Courage. Remember how I said she thought her husband had run off with another woman? Well, now she roams the grounds with the same axe in search of anyone who has been unfaithful. Some people call her the Wailing Woman, but it's really Hilda Wartman crying out for revenge. The counselors followed Tommy's blood trail to the lake, but though the police dragged it for days following, they never found a body. Only a rusty lawnmower blade they figured was garbage. That was because Tommy had emerged onto the lake's far shore, and there, under the cover of trees and twilight, he witnessed his mother's death. The demon inside him may have giggled, but the sight fanned a small spark of what remained of Tommy's humanity. After all, he just witnessed the only person who'd ever really loved him murdered by the camp. He swore to return the deed, but the demon restrained him. In time, he whispered. In time. For Tommy was still a boy. He needed to grow and become stronger. He also needed to do something about his missing hand, and so Tommy withdrew into the woods. Fifteen years passed, and what happened during that period remains a mystery. All we have are possible clues. Hunting camps plundered in the off-season. A large hook missing from a local meat house a hiker's dog chasing after a human figure in the trees, never to return, a family in a remote campground hearing footsteps circling their sight, accompanied by the scratch of metal and the sound of breathing through a sack, and finally, lone campers disappearing in the backcountry, every single one with a cut down the side of their tent. But fifteen years is plenty of time for Tommy to have honed his hunting and butchering skills, and Crazy Stan, the one who told me this story said this is the year Tommy plans to return to Camp Courage to exact his revenge. Sadly, Crazy Stan is no longer with us. Last week his body was found in the lake, ripped apart by something sharp and hook-shaped. Chapter 13 Sarah looked up from the notebook. That's where the draft ends. Jeez, Rusty said, removing his trucker cap to drag a hand through his mullet. That's even scarier than the Hookman story. Sounds a lot like this movie we watched on our scavenged VCR when I was a kid. Now, what was the name of that dang series? As he squinted off and thought, I considered how the story lined up with what we'd encountered. Explains why salt was effective against the wailing woman and the dogs, but not Tommy, I said. The source rendered the first as apparitions, but Tommy as something demonic. Also explains some of his abilities. Notes follow. Sarah frowned, carefully peeling open the next page with a pair of medical tweezers. Bullet points, but they're mostly washed out. Even dried, the writing will be too degraded. Send me some images and we'll give the AI a crack at them, Rusty said. Keep me posted. I donned my helmet and grabbed my MP88. I'm heading to the boathouse to look for that basement space. It's the one place in the story that belonged to Tommy, and I'm betting he's claimed it. I'm also betting that if the space didn't exist before the story, the source created it. The extraplanar space you hypothesized, Sarah said in understanding. Th that's right, Rusty stammered. That last sat shot of Bloom is right near there. We are finished placing the stones, Yuffie radioed. Do you still want me to wait? I checked the map on my flex tablet. Affirmative. Let's rendezvous with the boathouse in five. But be warned that the entity we encountered earlier may be using it as his base.
Don't enter until I arrive. Yes, Mr. Wolf. I radioed Olaf, who was at the camp's eastern boundary. How's your search going? We do not find woman, he replied. Bring Mr. Hanseroff back to base and meet us at the boathouse, I said. I've marked it on the map. After a moment of radio silence, he said, He will not come. Shit. Then tag him and come to the boathouse solo. Mr. Hanseroff was an adult. If he wanted to run around the woods after already having been attacked by an axe-wielding apparition, that was his choice. Copy. Keep drone two on Olaf, I told Rusty as I opened the door. I want both drones over the boathouse. What about Mrs. Hanseroff? He asked. We'll worry about her later. The rain crashed over my helmet as I sprinted toward the lake, my boots splashing through puddles ankle-deep in places. I arrived at a lake shore snapping with waves. Takara and Yuffie were in the house's shelter area where a couple rowboats had been hauled up. I'm inbound, I radioed. Takara had already sighted on me with her M4, but Yuffie reacted with surprise, spinning clumsily with his staff and squinting into the storm. I joined them under cover, aware that the ringing in my ears had altered slightly in pitch. While we waited for Olaf, I briefed them on the relevant details from Bloom's story. He is a demon? Yuffie whispered with a worried look. Demon-like, I amended. The source you just surrounded with Lingos is what's giving him form. It had taken me time, but it felt important to understand our opponent as a manifester of stories rather than as a prod one. Olaf radioed his arrival and came jogging up, a bucket's worth of rainwater pouring from his suit and weapon as he joined us. All right, I clapped his thick shoulder and nodded at the door of the boathouse. We're going to stack and enter. Once the room is cleared, we'll be looking for a trapdoor in the floor. With months of drilling under our belts, my teammates shifted into position. Olaf threw the door open and Takara entered, irises wreathed in flames. I followed on her heels, my night vision and weapon sweeping the room's other side. Yuffie came in behind us, a tan orb of light growing from his staff. The musty space held rows of life jackets, oars, and several large containers, but no entities. While Olaf manned the door, we searched the plank floor. It's hidden, I reminded my teammates, but after several minutes of squinting, pushing, and pulling, it was clear there was no trap door. Takara, who had been tapping the planks in a pattern, straightened. Solid, she announced. There is no subterranean space. Yuffie, I prompted. With a nod, he moved to the center of the room, staff raised. The stone blade seemed to draw in the ambient energy before sending it back out in a flash of green light. The light broke into a swarm of locust-like creatures that explored every crack and seam and chitters. If the door was mystically concealed, Yuffie's magic would find it. But when the final locust burned out, he shook his head. No door, Mr. Wolf, he said apologetically. I was prepared to start ripping up planks to be certain when Sarah's voice came over my radio. The AI is returning some interpretations of Bloom's notes, she said. It appears she was organizing ideas for a story set in Camp Dread. A counselor is abducted, and the maintenance man rescues her. Does it say from where? Too much of the interpretation is nonsensical, but I'm working to refine it. The word boat does appear twice. What about character names, I asked. Only Tommy Wartman. Not the name I'd wanted to hear, but I could guess at the identities of the counselor and maintenance man. Hadn't Mr. Hanseroff said Bloom had a crush on Dunphy? If true, these could have been her notes for a romantic fantasy, one she never meant to share. And if the fantasy had her crush playing the role of hero, there was a very good chance she was still alive, awaiting his arrival. Okay, I said, hope pumping inside me for the first time. I'm bringing Luke Dunphy in. A civilian? Sarah asked. Why? Because if he's the one who's meant to rescue her, then he's probably the only one the source will allow to rescue her. Chapter 14 What's going on? Dumphy asked, wavering shirtless in his cabin doorway. He'd taken so goddamn long to answer, I'd nearly hammered the door down. I immediately smelled why. The warm beer fumes on his breath and drifting from his pores were strong enough to power a small engine. Get dressed, I said, turning him around and guiding him back into the cabin. I'll explain on the way. Fortunately, I'd caught him sleeping, not passed out, and he managed to don some sensible articles without my help. On the run over, I'd been worried I would arrive to find him slaughtered, like in so many slasher films, 
but it appeared my logic around the source was holding up. It would preserve the key story elements, at least until they'd fulfilled their roles. In this case, Dunphy rescuing Bloom. When he was ready, we boarded his golf cart. I had mixed feelings about him driving, but the alternative, me carrying him in the rain, wouldn't work for a briefing. As he sped haphazardly toward the boathouse, I hunched my massive frame under the canopy and delivered a very sanitized version of events. Robin's under the boathouse? He asked when I finished. We believe so. There's no basement under there, man. I want you to look anyway, I said. Ever handled a firearm? Does a pellet gun count? No. But it was just as well. I was barely comfortable with the guy driving. As we neared the lake, he swerved the cart off trail, got stuck in the sand, then got unstuck in a way that resulted in us rocketing up the boat ramp. He slammed the brakes a moment before colliding into my teammates. I made quick introductions as I helped Dunphy from the cart and into the boathouse proper. What am I looking for again? He asked, peering around blearily. A trap door, I growled. I'm telling you, he said with a sigh. I've done work all over this place and there's no... He stopped suddenly. Hey, could you give me a hand with this? He nodded at a large container set against the back wall. I scooted it out of the way and there, set in the floor, was a trap door. Yuffie laughed in surprise while Takara squinted as if the door were a personal insult to her searching techniques. The fact of the matter was, it hadn't been there before. So far, my bet was paying off. Open it. I told Dunphy as Takara and I moved into covering positions. He shrugged and seized the rusted metal ring set in the door. The door yawned open to reveal a steep set of wooden steps stained with blood. A powerful, putrid stench filtered through my helmet's breathing apparatus. I motioned Dunphy away with my head as I lit a flare and tossed it down. It landed on a hard-packed dirt floor spattered with gore. I'll lead, I said. If it's clear, Dunphy follows, then Takara. Be ready, Yuffie, because the second we're out, I want you binding the source. I will be ready, Mr. Wolf. Leading with my MP-88, I descended the creaking steps. The ringing in my ears flattened into a familiar pressure. I was transitioning to another plane. The room that grew in my vision was the source's interpretation of what Bloom had described in her story. Tommy's torture chamber. The rotten heads of animals sagged from spikes while bones and mutilated carcasses littered the wall spaces. Among them were two large dogs, their bloated sides flayed open to the ribs. A long bench held a variety of metal objects Tommy had acquired and adapted for his bloody purposes. Crude hammers and blades. But that was largely peripheral for me because at the far end of the room, bound to a chair with braided rope, was a young woman in a Camp Courage shirt. Her head was angled back, eyes staring off to the side. But the same scent that told me this was Robin Bloom also told me she was alive. In shock, but alive. I overruled my instinct to grab her and race out. We had to do this right. I moved the barrels of my MP-88 around the ghoulish space before signaling to Takara, her image wavering slightly beyond the interface. As Dunphy descended the steps in front of her, I snapped on my weapon's powerful tactical light and aimed it at Bloom. It was as much to illuminate her for him as to wall off his surroundings in darkness. I couldn't risk him losing his nerve. When he arrived beside me, he stopped and stared at her. What the hell, man? Free her, I said, handing him my combat knife. And do it quickly. Takara and I covered his approach, the shock of finding her like this sobering him. Hang tight, Robin, he said, rising to the roll. Your bud's here. Luke's here. He studied the ropes and then started cutting through the one binding her right ankle to the chair leg. Gonna get you out of this mess. How is she? Takara whispered to me. Her pulse sounds a little thin from here and that's blood in her hair, but she's warm. Breathing. We'll take her straight to Sarah when we clear out. My senses were on a hair trigger, hyper-tuned to our surroundings. At the slightest sign Tommy Warpman was manifesting, I was going to put a silver round through his sack head. Better yet, several rounds. Meanwhile, Luke was making quick work of the ropes. He'd freed Bloom's legs, and now he was tossing aside the lengths that had bound her wrists. As he sawed through the concentric ropes around her torso, the woven purse he'd mentioned earlier came into view against her side. 
He unspooled the remaining rope, catching her as she slumped forward. I've got you. When their cheeks made contact, Bloom's staring eyes blinked. Luke? Yeah, it's me, buddy, he assured her. I've got you. Can you walk? I think so. As he straightened with her, Bloom's dark legs wobbled like a newborn foal's. Though she sagged against him, he wasn't having to bear her full weight. He squinted toward me, his face shiny with sweat. Bring her this way, I said. He nodded and coaxed her to walk with him. When they reached us, I instructed him to follow Takara up the steps. He guided Bloom up each one, their progress agonizingly slow, but it was progress. I covered the room, not trusting the old stairs to support my additional poundage. At last, the pair cleared the trap door. I ascended the steps backwards, MP-88 sweeping the room. All right, Yuffie, I called behind me. You can start binding that. The gloved hand that seized my ankle appeared from under the stairs. In the next moment, I was being yanked through the bloodied wooden planks. Chapter 15 I landed on all fours amid the stairs' wreckage, shaken but not stunned. With a quick pivot, I brought my MP-88 to my shoulder and scanned the room. I'd smelled Tommy, could still smell him, but he'd vanished, my night vision only picking out the flayed and dismembered shapes of his animal victims. Harsh breaths echoed around me. See anything? I called to Dakara. When she didn't answer, I glanced up. Instead of her framed silhouette, I was greeted by a closed trap door. My heart thundered with an animal's sense of imprisonment. Leaping, I slammed the stock end of my weapon against the door, but the wood didn't so much as splinter. My landing was met by a heavy boot to the back. The powerful blow sent me across the room. I spun on the seat of my suit, animal bones spilling off me, and aimed my weapon at Tommy's looming figure. The demon-possessed creation showed no signs of the damage we'd inflicted on him earlier. Even the burlap mask covering his head was in place. The source had not only re-rendered him intact, but made him larger, thicker and no doubt stronger. The same was true of the jagged hook extending from his wrist. My first two shots rocked his head back. The next four thudded inside his chest in acrid bursts of smoke. But Tommy barely broke stride, the silver not having the same effect as last time. Switching to auto, I emptied my magazine into his torso and face. Though a storm of debris seemed to fly from him, he hardly slowed. I was already moving away when his hook came down in a blinding flash. The son of a bitch had been made quicker, too. The blade grazed my shoulder, leaving kinks of bullet-resistant material in its wake. I brought my leg around and my foot connected solidly with his pelvis, but a blow that should have embedded him in the far wall only had him staggering back a few feet. The same laws of physics didn't apply to him, apparently. Fine, I growled, tugging off my gloves with my teeth. Let's see how you handle an animal that can fight back. I removed my helmet last, dropping it beside my MP-88, the quarters too close for grenade rounds or flamethrowing. Nostrils flaring, I circled Tommy. His chest heaved and his sack shook as he rotated to keep me in front of him. The wolf in me burned for this fight, but my more tactical side was watchful for any additional abilities he may have been granted. I didn't want another surprise. Move and counter-move, I coached myself. Move and counter-move. I ducked low as he slashed his hook horizontally, then thrust my head up, driving all my weight into his chin. He stumbled back, arms circling for balance. I smashed a fist across his face, then followed with a backhanded slash of talons, ripping open his neck. Dark blood belched out, spattering his mask in a Rorschach-like pattern. But he recovered, bringing the hook straight down. I arched away to one side, eyeing his now vulnerable weapon arm. Like an axe chop, my talons now crunched through rotten flesh near his elbow. When they scraped off metal, I understood his hook wasn't strapped on, but driven down the length of his bone. Tommy recoiled and raised his hook for another strike, but my blow had altered its seating. The hook listed at an angle around bony splinters. He paused, regarding it in seeming confusion. For a moment, I saw the poor boy who had had his hand severed by his mother, leading to her brutal death but that was just a story. With a roar, I leapt in and bit down on his failing arm. A horrid taste of death filled my mouth, and it took all my willpower not to gag it out. I caught his good wrist as his hand came down and gripped my skull. The goring points of pressure had me grimacing, but my teeth were now fastened around the hook's anchor. 
I reared back, ripping the weapon from what remained of his arm. Tommy moaned into a backpedal, blood spilling from his tattered sleeve. As I spat the hook out, he turned toward his table of torture implements. I tackled him from behind, driving him to the floor. With a lunging arm, he toppled the table, his gloved hand groping for a weapon. I knew my teammates were trying to get the trap door open. I also knew that being down here was delaying Yuffie's efforts to quarantine the source. One way or another, I had to incapacitate Tommy and clear out. I began by driving my fists into the back of his head, pounding his face into the hard-packed floor. As his fingers closed around the end of a rusty length of chain, I drew a silver-infused stake from my tactical belt and hammered it through his upper back as though finishing off a vampire. His entire body bucked into spasms. Now let's see how well you fight without a head, I growled. I slashed my talons down for the decapitating blow, only for them to grate through dirt. Tommy had vanished from under me. I retracted my arm and looked around, heart thundering in my chest. He was gone from the room entirely. Above me, the trap door opened and Yuffie's face appeared. Mr. Wolf, he called down. Are you all right? Yeah, I said, quickly gathering my things. Stand back. I threw my helmet and gloves out, then seized my MP-88. With a leap, I grabbed the opening and pulled myself through. As the magic Yuffie had presumably used to open the door shrank back into his staff, Takara stepped forward. Where are Bloom and Dunphy? I asked. Olaf's escorting them to base with the rusty overhead, she said. When you got trapped inside, I made the call. It was the right one, I told my second in command. Yuffie, you ready to end this? He nodded and closed his eyes. Energy radiated from his staff as I donned my gear. But a moment later, his eyes flew wide and the energy dispersed. A distant scream had sounded, followed by the popping of gunfire. Chapter 16 I'll take care of it, I told Yuffie. Keep going and don't stop till the source is sealed. Stay with him, Takara. I broke out into the rain just as the scream sounded a second time. A young woman's. I soon arrived on the scene of Dumphy's golf cart overturned and bloom on her knees, the rain flattening the hair to her head. She was screaming up at the horrific sight of a respawned Tommy. Like a scene from a horror movie, he'd embedded his hook in Dunphy's gut and was holding him aloft like a trophy. Dunphy's legs kicked feebly above the ground as lightning flashed through the surrounding trees. Olaf circled Tommy with his assault rifle, peppering him with silver rounds. But, like in the basement, the attack was scarcely effective. With a grunt, Tommy flung Dunphy away and turned to face Olaf, the length of chain he'd seized in the basement dragging from his other fist. Hold him off as long as you can, I shouted at Olaf, trusting his armor and regenerative abilities would be up to the job until he had backup. I turned to Bloom, who had scrambled to where Dunphy landed, blood spreading through his shirt and bubbling from his mouth. He was breathing, but barely. He needed help, and not the traditional kind. Yuffie, I radioed. Break off. We've got an emergency. I need you and Takara here now. As he returned to confirmation, Sarah's voice broke in. The AI assembled something else from Bloom's notes. Every time Tommy is killed, he comes back stronger, and he can't be harmed by the same attack twice. Great. Anything about how to kill him for good? Not yet. I'll keep searching. Though she was privy to the wild action through Rusty's drone feed, she spoke as if we were discussing chemical equations. I'll check with the author, I told her. She's right here. I approached Bloom, who'd managed to work her lap under Dunphy's head. The story you wrote about getting rescued, I called down through the rain. How does it end? She stared up at me, her arms wrapping Dunphy's head much as the woman at the burger place had done with her boyfriend. The young counselor was in shock, and I was roughly the same dimensions as the monster who'd just skewered Dunphy. Though he continued to sputter out breaths, he wasn't looking good. Listen, I said, kneeling in front of her. I don't have time to explain, but the story you wrote about Tommy and being kidnapped, it's happening. In order to help you, to help Luke, I have to know how it ends. She blinked the rain and tears from her eyes and shook her head. I, I don't know. What do you mean? You wrote it. But I never finished it. How far did you get? To, to Tommy attacking when we tried to run? As she stared at the monster she'd unwittingly created, my gaze fell to the woven purse hanging against her side. I tapped it, bringing her back. I need you to write the ending now. 
one that destroys him. With pen and paper, she said. In a storm? At that moment, Yuffie and Takara came hustling up. We need a shield over her and healing for him, I told Yuffie as I straightened. Then to Takara, help Olaf. The creature's stronger, but I need him occupied a little longer and away from these two. As she darted off, magic swirled from Yuffie's staff, hardening into a dome-shaped shelter above Bloom. Oh, this is bad, he muttered, peering at Dunphy now. But he got right to work, dribbling gray smoke over the nasty abdominal wound as he prayed and pleaded with his god for powers of healing. Sheltered from the rain, Bloom dug into her purse, one with a plastic liner, thank God, producing a notebook and pen. She flipped open the pages and began to write, but then stopped suddenly. In what ways haven't you attacked him? She asked. Right, he couldn't be hurt the same way twice, but we'd hit him with damn near everything in our arsenal, including my talons and teeth. I turned to where Takara had moved in front of Olaf. Struck by the chain, our zombie teammate had gone to one knee. Fire flashed from Takara's body in fierce wings, keeping Tommy back. She'd yet to go full dragon, but that would be asking a lot of her so close to our last mission. She was already wincing from the pain of channeling just a fraction of the being. Then I picked up the faint whine of Rusty's drone overhead. Missiles, I said decisively. Bloom nodded quickly and bent over her notebook. Did you hear that? I asked Rusty through our open channel. Loud and clear, boss. She is armed and ready. Okay, Bloom said, still writing. This is how it's going to go. I need you to decapitate him and chain him to that tree. She nodded at a stout trunk beyond where Tommy presently stood. The missiles will overpower the demon's connection to Tommy and blow them both to shit. Not the ending I originally had in mind, but... I took a laser reading of the tree with my flex tablet and sent the coordinates to Rusty. Got him, he confirmed. No last-minute twists. I warned Bloom as I left to help the others. Olaf had recovered, but Tommy was on the attack again, lashing his chain at Takara, who was countering with searing bursts of fire. I used the distraction to ease up behind Tommy and rest his arms behind his back. We need him headless, I shouted between grunts. No sooner had I spoken than Takara's blade was in motion, sending his sack-covered head toppling to one side. Let's go, I growled, maneuvering his body toward the tree. Even with my superhuman strength, the disoriented monster felt like an oil drum. Olaf joined me, and together we slammed Tommy against the trunk. Hold him, I said. Tommy's fist was still seizing the chain, but I took the loose end and wrapped it around the tree, pinning his arms. Olaf shoved himself away, allowing me to wrap Tommy a second time. I knotted the end of the chain through itself and waved everyone toward Yuffie. Our magic user alertly grew out the rain shield until we were all inside its protective dome, but Bloom was still riding. Tell me when, I said tautly. Back at the tree, Tommy was straining against the chain. Bloom had written the chain strong enough to hold him, evidently, but the tree itself was starting to shift, earth erupting around its base. Okay, she panted, scribbling out the last words and looking up. Rusty, you're cleared hot, I radioed. Incoming! he replied. Many stingers hissed from the sky and detonated at the base of the uprooting tree. Bright explosions engulfed Tommy's headless figure, sending up a demonic shriek. Bloom covered her ears, pen still in hand. In my wolf vision, I caught a fiendish shadow streaming after the scream before both broke apart in the night sky. And then body parts were raining around us, sublimating on impact. The hook came down last, knifing dramatically into the ground a few feet away. I waited for it to crumble to smoke before releasing my breath. But it wasn't over. Yuffie, I said. Nodding, he stood from Dunphy, who was breathing evenly now, his torso wrapped in healing magic. Yuffie raised his staff and chanted aggressively in Congolese, knitting the lingos he'd planted into an all-encompassing container to suffocate the source. To the north, light glowed from the lake illuminating the storm clouds a pale pink. The ringing ever present in my ears since we'd arrived faded out by degrees. At last, Yuffie lowered his staff and smiled wearily. It is done, Mr. Wolf. Chapter 17 By the time the sun broke over Camp Courage the following morning, Luke Dunphy was stable and awake in our base of operations. 
Yuffie's magic, coupled with Sarah's intervention, had repaired his abdominal wounds, setting his body on the path to healing. Bloom received treatment, too, mainly for dehydration. While on the IV drip, she shared her version of events. On the afternoon she went missing, she was returning from the church ruins, where she'd been working on a draft of her work in progress, when Tommy materialized in front of her. That was all she remembered before Luke Dunphy was cutting the ropes off her. She couldn't believe she had been missing for two days, among other things. Out there, you said the story I wrote came true? She asked. How is that possible? Though I answered as honestly as I could, I kept it general. According to Sarah's research, we were dealing with an exceedingly rare mineral storied for its manifesting properties. Rubesium was typically found in trace amounts, when it was found at all, but a sizable deposit rested under Courage Lake. Why it responded to Bloom may have been explained by her talent as a storyteller, but her purse held another explanation. A glittery pink stone she'd found on the lake shore and planned to turn into a pendant. A piece of rubesium. The pastor had been wearing something similar around his neck in the 1915 photo of the settlement. Not a cross, but a stone. The Klamath spiritual leaders had likely had their own fragments, establishing a connection between their intentions and the potent deposit under the lake. But don't worry, I told her. You can write whatever stories you want from now on, and they won't come to life. Really? She asked uncertainly. We've made sure of it. Early that morning, Yuffie had confided in me that he'd found a way to foul up the mineral's energy, rendering it inert. Dabu's asking price, a case of Premier Brandy. I told him to go ahead. There were some things you didn't want a private defense company like our parent Centurion getting their hands on. The contents of Bloom's purse explained something else, why I'd picked up Dumphy's scent in her cabin. Apparently, she'd stolen one of his bandanas to save her when they were apart. Though the admission embarrassed her, she was more concerned about his present health, especially since she felt responsible. When Tommy had capsized their golf cart the night before, Dunphy jumped out to protect Bloom. She had written that part into her draft, but it was as far as she'd gotten. She'd become stuck brainstorming ways for Dunphy to fight Tommy off. That left Tommy to his own devices, which meant skewering Dunphy. Are you sure he's going to be all right? Bloom asked for the tenth time. He'll be fine, I said. But watching the infatuation on her young face had me feeling like a concerned father. There was the age gap between them, not to mention Dunphy's abusive past. But had Dunphy not taken the hook to the gut, it would have been Bloom. Maybe that was his act of atonement, knowingly or not. As though coming to terms with something, Bloom's eyes darkened and she looked away from him. What's up? I asked. Nothing, she shrugged. We've hung around enough that I know he's not into me. He's a friend though, right? Don't discount that. I leaned toward her. And friends who do what he did are pretty damned hard to find. Yeah, she agreed quietly. Thanks to Olaf's tag, I'd been able to monitor Steve Hanseroff's movements on the map. He'd left the grounds to the east, idled in a dense section of woods for a few hours, and then, with the storm abating, returned to the admin building. Rusty's drone confirmed his wife was with him. Not long after daybreak, I saw his tag coming down the road toward us. I excused myself to go out and meet him. Is everything all right? He called. We found Robin in the boathouse, I said. She's fine now. The storm had ended, leaving behind cooler air and drifts of sun-infused mist. Thank God, Steve said, pressing a hand to his chest as he arrived in front of me. Luke had a run-in with something, but he'll recover. He'll just need to go on inactive duty for a couple weeks. You won't be seeing any more apparitions around here. That's been taken care of, too. Steve didn't ask any of the expected follow-up questions. Then again. He wasn't the client, and I could tell he had other things on his mind. What about you and Mrs. Hanseroff? I asked. I found her where I thought I might. There's a campsite a couple miles from here, closed now, but it's where we had our first overnight date. God, twenty years ago. He shook his head. The storm got worse, so we took shelter in what's left of the host's old cabin before heading back. We're both fine. Did she say why she ran? He chuckled uneasily and scratched the back of his neck. 
It turns out she thought I'd done something to Robin, he said. She didn't see the attempted kiss, but she saw me take her backpack. That's why she'd been acting so strange, seizing on every explanation under the sun for Robin's disappearance. She couldn't accept that I might have been involved. It finally got to be too much. Understandably, I grunted. Anyway, the storm forced us to talk it out, her fear around me taking the backpack, then me telling her I'd taken it partly out of my fear that she'd done something. We laughed over that, as crazy as it sounds, but it was the first time in a long while we'd shown actual concern for each other. We have a lot of work to do, but we're committed to fixing things. I think we're headed to a healthier place anyway. Though his hair was a wreck and his eyes puffy from lack of sleep, the way he talked told me he was already in a healthier place. Glad to hear it, I said. We'll be in contact with the owner. His face tensed. Are you going to say anything about... No, I decided. Your involvement didn't impact the case. Much, I added in my head. Lips compressed, he seized my right hand in both of his and shook it passionately. I'll be better he promised. I know. Back at base, we arranged evacs for Bloom and Dunphy and then went to work breaking down and packing equipment. Another mission accomplished and further proof I could depend on my new team. Sarah's investigative skills, Olaf's bullish tenacity, Takara's power and savvy, Yuffie's clever magic. And then there was the unlikely hero. As I passed Rusty coming from the van, I clapped his shoulder. I've been meaning to ask, I said. How did it feel taking out the big bad hook man? Oh, boss, that might have been the finest moment of my life. I mean, he mimed the missile strikes and Tommy blowing apart, complete with spluttering sound effects. Besides the birth of my kids, of course, but I don't think I'm going to be worrying about that giant sack of ugly ever again. I'm glad it was therapeutic. Are you and me going to road trip back? No, we're flying back as a team this time. When I saw the anticipation on his face turned to disappointment, I said, But I'll tell you what, how about a feast of Big Top burgers in the mess hall tonight to celebrate? But the closest Big Top is over 200 miles from campus. Shouldn't be a problem for a company of Centurion's resources. I'll ask nicely. If you can pull that off, he said through a growing smile. It'll be the second finest moment of my life, boss. No bullcrap. I laughed. Then consider it a done deal. Thank you for listening to Camp Dread, a Blue Wolf Brief, the first in the Legion Files series. If you enjoyed this story, please like and comment to let us know. And don't forget to subscribe for more audiobooks set in the same world. When you're ready for the Blue Wolf series, all 50 hours are now available on Audible. Camp Dread, a Blue Wolf Brief, was written by Brad Magnarella. Narrated by James Patrick Cronin, a member of SAG-AFTRA. Copyright 2023 by Brad Magnarella. Production Copyright 2023 by Brad Magnarella.